What's going on you guys? It's your Huggable Hipster here and welcome back to The Casual Nerd. Today I have a very awesome guest who agreed, I didn't pay him at all, don't worry about that, uh, yeah. who agreed to be on the podcast, ACG. He is what I would call a reviewing king of YouTube. Very inspirational to how I do my reviews. So I want to say thank you so much for being on the podcast. How are you today? I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm good. I'm glad to be yeah. here. I'm glad to be here. It's all, like I was telling you, it's seven hours of podcasts and I, I love it. I love talking about games, so I'm excited to do it. And, and interestingly enough, I have to ask, how much coffee did you have for that? <laughs> uh, I've had very little. I am high energy all the time. So I've had a monster energy drink, and I'm drinking water out of the can right now. Oh That's it. Gosh. Yeah. I, I, luckily enough, high energy. So helps with the job, right? It does. It really does. That's how I know. I'm normally very bubbly. And I mostly have tea. A lot of people think I have mm. coffee 24 seven, but no, I, I just have coffee for the taste. It doesn't affect me anymore. I wish it would. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Once it, once it wears off, you're like, damn, now I got to replace it with something. Yeah, exactly. But you guys today, we are going to be talking about game reviews because yes, he's a reviewer. I am a reviewer. And I thought, you know what? The other reviewers that I had to talk about reviews were Tony Blanco and Gene Park. And those were absolutely incredible discussions that I had with them. And I thought, well, you know what? I really want to get ACG's opinion on a lot of stuff that's going on right now, where the trend with reviews is going, where video reviews are even going. So sure. my first topic that I want to discuss is what is one game that it, or a genre that you won't touch? Like if you're asked to review it, you just won't go near it. Well, first of all, I want to say Gene is awesome. I've had him on the podcast three or four times. That guy's crazy hilarious. And we have some hugely divergent ideas on some of the way like what we take to heart for a review and stuff like that and he's always one of the guys that you can ask a question and he'll explain it really well even if you don't agree with him you'll be when you get done i'm like i got you that guy is awesome um a game genre i would i will probably review anything other than gotcha games stuff like that i probably would steer clear because um i they're normally a gameplay loop that is just not enticing to me Sports games they have to be very particular for me to jump in. If it's an MMA game, because I'm a, I teach martial arts, I'm an MMA fan. I would probably do that. Sports games, for the most, I usually steer clear from. They're just the repetitiveness of seeing 24, 25, 26, the year, you know, 2K24. It, it kills my soul a little bit, not in even an originality way, just in I usually know the sport of football hasn't drastically changed. If there were landmines, sure, I'd probably play it, but. Yeah, that's the same for me. If, if I'm going to review a game, it has to have a story to it. It has to have some sort of substance to it of where it's just like, oh, this is the point of the game. For me, honestly, I don't find a point in sports game. You're literally doing the exact same thing over and over again. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of pre of technology. And so if if we jumped into a new generation, like a PlayStation 6 and an Xbox Series XXL or whatever the hell they call it, I would certainly look at possibly jumping into that to see if they've improved uh, mocap because, I'm a, like I said, I'm a huge tech fan. but. The, overall, I'll cover anything because I do love games. And even I'll, I even like those games that I just said I probably wouldn't review. It's just because as a reviewer, you may have to force yourself to play longer than you would like to. And so on a sports game, even finishing a sports game, for example, when you hear somebody say, should a reviewer beat a game? Of course, like makes sense. How do you beat a football game though? It's, it's kind impossible. of a fine line with that. Yeah, so it's like, oh, do you get to the Super Bowl? What, you know, there's all these weird little, yeah. So those, those I probably steer. It's interesting because I, it's funny you bring up like, can you actually beat that kind of a game? Because whenever I go into games that have like multiple endings, well, how many endings do you have to beat before you do the review? Kind Banishers of thing? is like that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Banishers just came out, and it was, uh, it's probably some of the best writing outside of Chris Avalon, who did like, you know, your your older style games. He's done incredible writing. And it's got five endings, I think, that we know of. I don't know if there's a hidden one, but I definitely did two because I was like, I should probably do at least two of these to sort of get an idea of of what the what the differences is. But yeah, that comes up a lot. Or any roguelike or that doesn't have an ending, let's say, or it starts over right after. You're like, all right, so how much of this, you know, do you have to experience? Which I actually find interesting in the review itself to figure out what is the end game, or is there an end game, and does the lack of an in-game harm it or does it actually improve it? You know, it depends on the title, of course. Exactly. Like, for example, I um, I just finished last week Dark Souls 2 for the first time. Mm -hmm. Part for of it was, time. it was, it was, yeah, part of it was interesting. Part of it was very underwhelming. I'll 
say at the least. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I went through it, there were oh, there were two different endings that you could get, but there was only one main ending that you could get pre Scholar of the First Sin update. So when you go into that game, you're experiencing it and you're having an interesting time, and right. you have to go through so many loops and jumps in order to get to that second ending. Whereas in Dark Souls One. You have, I think, two or three different endings you can get. Dark Souls 3, you have four different endings you can get. So they kind of like short drifted it with that. And I thought, well, do I really need to get the second ending to get the main point of the game? Really don't. With some, it just depends on how the game is made. I'm going to be completely honest. Yeah. And some endings are, they are, you can, they're noticeably less impactful. Like they're sort of like just the, the, here's a short thing. And then you know that there's maybe a all good choice ending or all bad choice ending. Um, it's, it's interesting though, cause I got to ask you, cause we just had, we, we do these huge group discussions and the discussion today was dark souls and we were trying to figure out who, which one was the best and mine, at least in my group, which was definitely the minority, but I like dark souls three, the best. I don't know why oh, I couldn't tell you why, but I liked Yeah. And in that group, I think I was the only one. So which do you like best? Like of all the dark souls. So I kind of have a bias towards the first because it was the first Souls game I ever played sure. back in 2021, and I had never played any Souls games before that. And right. people were trying to get me into them, and I thought, okay, let me pick up the first Dark Souls one, and it clicked for me after I beat Smo and Ornstein, and I was like, okay, this game is incredible. Oh, you I mean it, it clicked with you as a game, as a as a full as, experience at yeah, that point? Yeah, it did. I yeah. See. And I was like, okay, this is great. It even made like solidified my love for it even more after I beat Artorius. That I was like, this game yeah. is incredible. I love it. It's funny that you had to go that, like, so, I mean, I don't mean to say it's not that far, but that you had to go that far to get it because Dark Souls for me, definitely the first one was too cumbersome. I just did, I wasn't, I think it's because, you know, over time they, you know, they get some finesse in there. The control's a little bit tighter. Uh, I, I had issues with number one and I don't know what happened with two. I liked it. But three, for whatever reason, I still don't even know. I wouldn't even be able to, sort, other than saying nostalgia and I remember liking it more and I overall like it more. I've found that those games I usually like, if it's a Dark Souls style, like Surge or Elden Ring, Sekiro, not Wulong, but you know, and that's one of them. But those games, I usually find I like it within the first two or three minutes. And what I mean by that is if it's going to grab me, and it doesn't mean it can't change, but it's, I usually, I'll just walk around and the movement is so, I mean, it's vital. So the moment I walk around in a circle and I see how the character leans, how the character moves forward, what the momentum system's like, does the character stop right away or do they take a foot, you know, a couple, you know, feet steps before they slow down. That's you. Uh, movement is such a big deal to me in games. And you'll hear it in all my reviews. I'll be like, this guy walks around like a bag of dicks or, you know, I'll say something <laughs> exactly. stupid because I'm so mad at the way the game the character moves that when you get a good Dark Souls style game, it when they move well, it like Neo 2, when I played, when I started Neo 2 and I started like just slightly moving in that game, I was like, oh my God, I love it. I, I already know I'm going to like, at least like the movement system. And then that I think just makes the rest of the game much easier. Especially when you look at like these Lambert levels, all this kind of crazy intricate levels, that does matter to me. But the bosses are sort of what they're about. I mean, in the long run. And so I think for me, maybe that's why I just like three better than the others is because I did like the bosses. And I rem- I don't necessarily even remember them or their movements as much as just emotional resonance if I beat somebody. And a lot of times in some Dark Souls games, you'll play a game, any game. I shouldn't even say Dark Souls. You'll play a game and the boss will be very, uh, they're just sort of cheap. They're, they've got these weird attacks that you're like, okay, I get it. This is going to be a second phase. This is going to be whatever. But when a game does a boss well, when I beat it, I feel better if they weren't cheesing and I wasn't cheesing. If it was like mono a mono and it's like my skill and at my build against their whatever magic ability they probably have. And so I think that's why I like three better. Yeah, I think the main reason why I like three was Dancer of the Boreal Valley. That was you like heaven, that? I, that was heaven of a boss battle for me because at first it was this creature that was going in and swooping. And now I see where from software got their design for the true yeah. monk in Sekiro. <laughs> Yeah, well, and that is one thing. A, a lot of the companies, you know, especially we just talked about this in the podcast, but you can only have so many different kinds of monks, right? Like they'll start to look the same. And so you see that in a lot of games where it, regardless of what they're doing, there's some copy there or there's a, a at least a little bit of of sub, a, a, a sort of objective um, template, I guess you would say, in some of the in some of the boss battles. But what I find enjoyable is 
when you get a boss that sometimes looks a certain way and then they pull off something that's like you never thought that they would be able to pull off or they do something crazy and some dark souls games style games i think they get i think the developers get almost motor set to sort of have the same kind of experience like you drop down a ledge there's a bull valley that's where the bad guy is oh there's a bunch of things to heal myself i know a bad guy is through this door and so there's certain games that resonate me with uh, with me with surprise of, of of a boss. For instance, Sekiro, the uh, the military guy who comes out on the horse. Oh yeah, and he announces oh. himself. <laughs> that was I epic. was by myself. You're not able to talk to anybody as a reviewer. They tell you distinctly. They're like, you can't talk to anybody. And I'm sitting there at home, and that guy's like, I'm Commander Kickass or whatever, and he's like, <laughs> and I and I was sitting there at my house just going, Are you shitting me? And it was it was such a, a cool difference because a lot of bosses in those games are mysterious or they're ghostly or they're this. And he's just like, boom, I'm on a horse and I'm going to spear you to death. And I was, That's and he true. announces himself. There was something. So, you know how a lot of souls games are dark and solitary and there's some, uh, not a lot of talking in a lot of them. There was something about that moment where the silence was broken by him yelling at me. And I was just like, yeah, this is going to be sweet. It was one of the best boss battles I've had, even though the game itself, I didn't like, a ton of the bosses there, like some of them. Some of them I found a little weird, but uh, overall, that was an <laughs> amazing boss moment. It, it's interesting that you mentioned Sekiro because I, I had this conversation with Fighting Cowboy before, and I have to ask you now, he and I are on the same train of thought of where Sekiro is now a souls like. What do you think? Um, first of all, I pronounce it wrong every time. So, anybody listening, I apologize. But um, I would say that it, that so a big problem I have, especially with current coverage, is that there is a discussion that goes from sort of, let's say, the podcast theory thinking into actual, like, let's say, a review. So you get somebody saying this genre is a bullet hell, roguelike, sport, adventure, blah, blah, blah. I will say that while you guys may have that discussion as a reviewer, I get to the point to where I'm like, it's Dark Souls like, and that's good enough for me. And it changes enough, but it still has a great many like conveniences and comparisons between any Dark Souls game you'll play. So if I'm talking to a person and I'm doing a review, I'm going to use the words that they're going to best understand. And most people, despite what you and me may discuss on a podcast like right now, it's easier for me to talk to the normal world and call it a Dark Souls like because to them and the, do you know where this comes up? rogue like and rogue light and exactly. we have had i mean we don't even talk about it on the podcast anymore because it's become such this dumb i don't call i i don't mean to say dumb in podcast form but in review form where if it's become this situation where people get so caught up on the ca category that they're not even listening to the game review anymore they're so busy like well technically and you're like listen games have Push exploded in their genre <laughs> yeah and, and movies have done it too it used to be oh this is a horror movie this is this, then it was action horror. Then it's actually comedy horror. And at some point, if you put 10 categorizations on something, you've lost the actual, the actual like train of thought. So yeah, for me meaning. and you, I would say I somewhat agree, but I also think that there's so many similarities that any casual gamer who needs to know about a game or wants to talk about it could use that around me. And I wouldn't go, that's wrong. You know, I would just, <laughs> I true. get where you're coming from, but it's a, it, it definitely is getting in the weeds, I think, of of the discussion of the game. And yeah, as a reviewer, I don't get into that as much unless I'm with you in a podcast. Yeah, and that's the thing too of where like there's so much nuance to a lot of stuff of where like I've I've actually had to break it down on on Twitter for a lot of people, and I, I don't care if people call it X. I'm st it's still Twitter in my heart. Um, and any time. Oh yeah, it's Twitter. I, I haven't called it X ever. So yeah. Yeah, it's always Twitter. Um, but anytime like I'll talk to people about it on Twitter, they'll they'll be like, "Well, get off your high horse." And it's like, "Well, it is. You have to separate consumer from creator because creators yeah. use different language, different dialect, different right. nuances than the consumer does. A consumer, they do the work that they do. They do gaming as a hobby. It's not a necessity for them to be able to right. put food on the table, you know. And a lot of people thought that I was being rather, you know, kind of conceited about it. And it's like, no, there's just a big difference about it because if it weren't a job they wouldn't they wouldn't really care about it they just play games to have fun with it we play games to analyze them to go into deep conversations about them and not that people don't go and do that who have it as a hobby but it's not a job for them you know
Yeah, and I think you're right, and 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 that's why I wanted to make sure I was clear that I think what happens is podcasts, stuff like that, especially when I do a review, I'll even say, if you want to hear more about the game, we'll talk about it on the podcast. And I've had people say, well, this company 10 years ago did something bad. Why did you rate the game a buy? And I'll be like, well, the game is worth that, especially because, let's say, a brand new gamer who just entered gaming yesterday got their first PlayStation 5. They don't care about 10 years ago that this company screwed another company over. They just care, is the game exactly, good? Exactly. Yeah. And so what I usually will say is I'll be like, on Wednesdays and Fridays, we do our podcast and we're going to dive. And we definitely talk about company politics or the difference between consumers and, and creators. There is a difference. I will say that one nice thing about streamers is that, well, some streamers, is that um, they are a little at times closer in, depending on if it's an ad, I want to talk. I'm talking about somebody who just plays a stream, just stream in a game for the love of games. I would say it's not condensed or edited, which I do find at times when I watch a streamer, I like that. I sort of like that they're just playing the game to play the game, and they can sometimes be a little bit more consumer like, show frustration at the moment, but then later they have no issues. Where a reviewer, as you know, you might play a game, there's 10 frustrations and there's 50 things you like, but you still have to explain the frustrations. And you still have to then explain your review score. And you're like, oh my God, I got to edit 15 minutes out of 40 to 70 hours of footage. And then like a recent review I just did had an NDA that was ridiculous. I mean, it was, it, I had to parse that thing through chat GPT to figure out exactly what stuff I was showing, what I could show, what I couldn't show. And so the different, the different levels of discussion is there. It's not only there for a creator and a, and a, and a person just playing the game. It's also there for a creator who runs a podcast or if they stream or if they do a review or if they do a preview, which oh, is yeah. a, <laughs> for me is a huge issue right now when I see previews and reviews not matching. Well, sometimes not matching up and I'll see, I'll see these weird differences. And even I have to remind myself that's a preview. That's not a review. And even when I go into preview events, I have to tell the people I'm mostly a reviewer. So if I have a problem, you will hear about it. And I've had companies say, we don't want you. Like we just flatly, we only want positive wow. stuff because it's a preview. I'll be like, I get it. I, well, I do get that because preview it's PR, you know, they, some companies, not all, but some companies, that's what they want is a mouthpiece to spread the word. And then you do Interesting. the review later. Okay. So it's yeah. more like just an ad instead of actually giving your opinion. It is, it. or it's just, I don't know if you've ever had this. Do you, do you, have you ever done like long-term streams, like multiple streams in a row of a game that's early, let's say, or before review? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Early on in my career. Yeah. OK, so I don't know if you had NDAs for those, but I could show you NDAs where the preview NDA and the review NDA and the streamer NDA are dramatically different. They are. And yes. I've had I've had NDAs that say explain. And by the way, this is no pr uh, big company from anybody we would care about. This is a Chinese company, but uh, and, and, and one that wasn't releasing a very good game. And they stated oh, in the review or, or in the stream, they wanted me to stream and they stated Please inform all people watching that all bugs seen will be fixed. Well, first of all, as a tech guy and who's programmed, I'm like, that's impossible. It's flatly impossible. It will never happen. Not all game, not all games or all bugs we see will be fixed on day one. There will be issues that I run into. So, you know, you get those kind of situations where you have to sort of separate church and state a little bit. And you have to identify what type of coverage it is, which is definitely the difference between previews, reviews, podcasts. So there forth. was a stream I had to do. It was a sponsored stream back, whatever. It was a, my very first one that I ever did. So I was a little uh, naive about how sponsorships actually right. work. Yeah. And it was back in my Twitch days. I'm not on Twitch anymore. And mm -hmm. they actually said, you can't say anything overly negative about the game. Right. Yeah. And I do understand, depending on what they do, Sue, I have removed myself in two ways. I buy every game regardless if they give me a copy. So the moment I get a copy, I'll buy a digital version or I'll buy a code and give it away to a patron because that's sort of my thing. And then the other is we don't do sponsors at all, ever. And one of the reasons why is because I personally believe, and you know this, but consumer psychology, psychology itself has proven, there is no doubt on this, by the way. There is, if you, any research paper in the world will prove this, that the price of something, including free, makes a dramatic impact on the thought process of you rating it of you giving your opinion of it and your interaction with it. And by the way, anybody who ever says otherwise is flatly ignoring the science of it. Like it is there, it's done. So what I did was I removed myself prior to starting the pod or prior to starting the channel. I was like, you know what? I don't want to be involved in that. I don't, I don't want to have these issues. So 
getting involved with sponsors and with Twitch, I do support people doing it. But I do have to say that even the best of intentions, the absolute best of intentions are adjusted by pure human psychology, unless you're a psychopath. If you if like, if you're, or if you're, if you're just out there, you know, you're just a crazy man, then it may not impact you. The same thing goes with preview events. I pay my way. So, and I've had companies actually not like have a difficult time where I'm like, I don't want your airplane ticket. I will play, I will drive there. You will see me at 11 AM. That's your scheduled time. I've done it with Ubisoft many times. They'll say we're doing something in San Francisco. So we'll drive down and they get confused because they're so unaccustomed to it. They'll be like, no, man. And I'm like, it's not better than anybody else. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with me wanting to make sure that I sort of have a fresh filter that's not impacted by a trip paid for by some company where I'm going to an event and they're whining and dining you and, you know, they're feeding you, they're having you do interviews. Oh, you get to do an interview. And I'm like, yeah, I'd really like to see the game because the interview really doesn't have any connection with the finished product. It's the finished product that does. And it's been really awesome because most companies are great with it. They get a little confused. But most companies actually understand it, which I actually found um, in uh, really encouraging because when I started, I thought when I did this, no one would give me codes. And instead, most of the time, if I don't get them from the main company, what will happen was a developer will call the main company and say, we do want Carrick to get a code. Can you please give him a code anyway, even though he doesn't, you know, do the, or he's not going to the preview event. Can we still give him footage or whatever? It's very so cool. Nice. Yeah. It's very, it's very nice of them to, to like still be able to do that. And very nice doesn't equal anything to me when the end product comes either. Cause I've had some previews where I'm like, I don't think this is gonna be good. I'll get a review and I'll be like, it's still not good, but it is, it is cool to see that they're a little um, more flexible. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because I just want to preface this for everyone who's watching that my camera likes to track your apparently. camera moved anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just, listen, I have a camera crew behind me. And it's just how it works. Yeah. There's people who work yeah. behind me. Just zooming in like <laughs> glamour shots. Exactly. Oh man. No, it's, it's so funny to me because like, I remember when I had Pine Cowboy on the, on the podcast, he was like, did your fucking camera just move there? I was yeah, like, you have right. a crew behind you. <laughs> you got a poltergeist. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, no, but I wanted to make just preface something for people who are watching that do, just because of what you know ACG is saying, that doesn't equate to like it's bad for everyone. This is just the way that yeah. he wants to do yeah. his stuff. Yeah, it works so. better for me, and um, it, it has worked very well for me. And it's been nice because Gene Park didn't know that, and he started buying games. He had posted a couple a couple months ago. He's like, you know what? Because he, he came on the podcast, we talked about it. And he's like, you know what? That makes perfect sense. Like, I am gonna buy the games from now on even if I get a code, because there is a little bit of the skin in the game that I think can slightly clear that filter up that might get a little muddy depending on what you're doing. So, oh yeah. And that's the thing too. Like I buy all of my copies, you know, if I can get a copy of, uh, you know, alongside with the review key that I get from a company, that's absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. Cause a lot yeah. of these games, I've, man, they're getting expensive. And the thing is, is yeah. that whenever I go into buying a game, I always have to either wait for a sale or I'm going in there being like, no, I need a copy of this game. Like Final Fantasy 16, I need to get a copy of that yeah, game, even right. though the review code right. was sent to me. Um, and it's interesting too, because the first time I ever got a AAA review code key was for Forspoken. And that was a wild ride because I did not expect to A, love the game as much as I did, apart from like a few things that they needed to fix. But I didn't know that the company would be so receptive to me being as honest as I was. Like, okay, there are some things that you need to fix here. There are some things that you need to do here. And people always assumed in my comment section, like, oh yeah, no, she got a key. She's gonna like, you know, kiss ass and everything. It's like, no, I'm still gonna be honest. Well, let me explain <laughs> something. I didn't like it and reviewed it poorly and they still were open to it. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, it's Enix with Ubisoft. I, I had somebody a couple months ago who was randomly saying like, oh, you just love all Ubisoft games. And I'm like, have you gone and looked actually? Because I'm pretty sure I think 75% of Ubisoft games, the big ones, Assassin's Creed, I've actually rated wait for a sale. A lot of times the bugs, you know, you'll get like a lot of issues with the open world games. And uh, they're the company that I've hammered on their games. I mean, hammered on them. And the very next day they'll be like, okay, so thanks. Do you want another code? For this game and i'm like that's the way to do it just and and there is i'm there is absolute dishonesty that goes on in any industry but i was um there are times where i am surprised how receptive a pr person and especially devs are very receptive i've had devs where i've hammered a game 
and it has been a trash heap. It has been a dumpster fire. It's been a terrible game. And they're the first comment on YouTube saying, we appreciate you doing it. We're going to look into these and fix them. It's been indie titles. It's been triple A's. I've had, that is one thing I think that a lot of people forget is they see the title, they see the publisher, they see maybe the head developer do the discussion. Like Callisto Protocol, for instance, which right. really landed really for a lot of people very poorly. And then there was also, you know, the main guy going out and doing interviews. But there's also some texture artist who's just really proud of making a foot texture that he thought was awesome. And what I like is you'll see, I mean, I've got a lot of posts from those people who are like, hey, I appreciate you. Even if you didn't like the game, you actually mentioned this music that I made or you mentioned this AI that you liked. And I appreciate that regardless of all the other stuff. It's very cool to see that because they are people. I mean, and it doesn't matter how many people, how many interviews we see, we see what 0.01% of the actual people making the game. They're doing, you know, a preview here. Or they're doing an event here, but the rest of the people are just there at a computer somewhere, not on an interview, you know, trying to figure out where a bracket is in a friggin' C plus code, you know? It's honestly, yeah. Cause like most of the people who you see in like the naughty dog, uh, you know, big productions yeah. that they do for them, that's like tenth of a percent of the people who yeah, work yeah. there. Yeah, if that, know? if that, especially as the games get bigger and you're seeing 800 person teams for Ubisoft titles and you're like, damn, that's a big title and a lot of money. So it, it better deliver, but. Okay, so the next uh, topic I really want to get into is something of where I always thought I have my favorite reviews that I've done that I'm just really, really proud of. What is your favorite review that you have written? Doom 2016, yeah. Doom 2016. Nice. Uh, Doom, uh, there, it was just, it worked well and I don't script. So, which we found out on the Final Fantasy review because I had a glitch during the review. And I say, I talk about the same thing for a brief second, but I say completely different thing. I mean, I'm, I say the exact same things that I thought of it, but I say it in a different way. And you can hear me not scripting like that. I don't believe in scripting for me personally. I do not like scripting. I take notes and I do some file stuff, but. Um, 2016 flowed well. It felt good. The game was good, which always helps. If a game's really bad, it can be fun, I guess, now that I think about it. Um, but 2000, it, it was, and it was a great game and it was a good return to form. It was phenomenal to play and it was easy to talk about. Some reviews, there's so much tit for tat that it can become very, it's, it, it almost becomes different. It's like a battery where it's hard to discharge because there's so much that you're trying to say, but you're also trying to lead somebody to the end result. And because I don't do scored reviews, I don't do the, uh, the one, two, three, four. I usually mix everything together. So when I talk about gameplay, I might actually use music to talk about gameplay because the music might have a stinger that alerts you of a bad guy, or it might have a sound. And so when I mix all of them, I have to make sure to not say, I used to say music is up next, but I've sort of stopped saying that as much. And I have to make sure it all flows well. 2016 just flowed well. And it, I, I always go back and listen to it. And I'm like, okay, that's actually like, that's, that's very, that's good for me. That's sort of where I want to be able to deliver the data I want to a consumer without it being super long. Cause I've, I mean, reviews are getting shorter and longer too. So when I started reviewing, I used to say, this is ACG. I do reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullshit. That's how I started. And I thought two minutes would never be eclipsed. I thought there's no chance somebody would do a review shorter than two minutes. And now we have YouTube shorts and we have 60 Jeez. second reviews. That's unbelievable. So, yeah. So I stopped saying it because sorry, my dog knocked the light out. Yeah. I stopped saying it. Cause I was like, oh yeah, we actually do have two. We actually do have 60 second reviews. Now I used to think there was no chance somebody would do a review that short. And now I see them all the time or I see little three minute reviews and now we're seeing 30 minute reviews. It, it's difficult to know how long you need to talk about a game. It like, is. Yeah. Like normally my reviews are like almost 10 minutes because I what my process yeah. is, is that I'll normally discuss a review. I'll have the review written for an article version and then I'll use that as my script oh. for when I do the video right. version. But while I'm playing the game, I also take notes while I'm doing it. Yeah. That way I have everything kept logically because for my Baldur's Gate 3 review that I'm doing, that was a long game. I finished it in like 99 hours of gameplay right. and that was massive to go through. Same thing with uh, Dark Souls 2. It took me over, I think, 120 hours to get through it because there were so many little intricacies that people need to like understand throughout it. That way they know that the lore is the same going through it, but since right. it was made by a different development, 
team, to be completely honest. It was not. It wasn't the same as any other Souls game, but you saw the Souls captured in certain yeah. bosses. So it's very, yeah. there are so many intricacies when you're doing a review, as you know, that you have to always bring up and never, any review is never going to be the same. It might right. be a completely yeah. different process. Yeah, it'll be a different process. And then also it will be, um, I mean, if it's a bad game and it's fun to tease it because it's so bad, like the characters do something stupid, that's one thing. But when it's a game that um, looks like it could go someplace and doesn't, that requires a certain thought process that might be a little bit different and a little less flowy, a little less smooth than a game that just is good. And, you know, there's a couple little issues with it. They definitely have different feels to the reviews. Oh, yeah. And, doing and, and for me, my review that I really thought that I did pretty well was on the uh, Death Stranding. So. Oh, really? That was mine. Yeah. Death Stranding's a game, man. I, I would rather jump in front of a car than play that game. <laughs> And I tried, I will always give a game, just like a TV show or a movie, I'll give them three or four attempts, you know, cause I think that um, sometimes that's required and I don't know what it is about that game, but wow, <laughs> man. I mean, I, I, and I don't ever get tired. Even when I'm ready to sleep, I'm not tired. And oh, I no. swear to God, that was the first game ever where I was sitting there going, what? I, I just, I don't know what it was. It, it might be even the thing you like about it, right? It might be the sedateness. It might be the the travel. It might be whatever. And I love walking simulators. It's one of my favorite genres of games. But for whatever reason, that game didn't work for me. And that's the, another thing that I like is um, when you do get those games that are different, like Death Stranding, because I know a lot of people didn't like Death Stranding. I don't think it's a bad game. It's just whatever, for whatever reason, didn't work for me. Like it just didn't work. But it is cool when you, uh, what I like is not only uh, like, you know, it's great to have my own that I like, but I actually love finding somebody who does coverage that I don't expect. And I, and for example, writing on games, uh, Seamus, oh, yeah. he's not a huge YouTuber, but his, he did a video that is, I mean, honestly, I was embarrassed. I was like, I'm, I just, I'm done. Like this guy's <laughs> way beyond me. So he did a video where I think he broke down Hitman's. It maybe broke down each level of Hitman, but his ability during that video, he's had other videos that maybe he didn't click as well, but during that video, he's describing what the level made him feel and all this stuff. And it's not a review. It's a different thing. But I remember listening to it going like, damn it. Like, damn, that was good. Like, and, and I, Total Biscuit was that way. Um, cause I, I, I was lucky enough to meet him before he passed away and he helped oh, me nice. multiple times and I was a competitor. Like there were times where people would be like, well, Carrick says this, TB says this. And when I met TB and started talking to him, all we really found out was that we both really like games. Like that was, that was cool. And I would listen to him talk about a game and cover it. And he'd get dry for a second and cover his stats or his, his, uh, G, you know, graphics options. But then once he really liked something, I, I don't know why, but I clicked with the way he talked and that does matter. You know, you'll, you'll listen to some and you just be like, this isn't for me. Um, I actually find myself not listening to mine ever, except for Doom. I do, I do actually listen to that occasionally because it reminds me of like uh, what I think is a good uh, delivery from me. But what I find is watching other people that are maybe not huge because they have a, they haven't, maybe they haven't set up to do exactly what everybody else has done. And there's something about that that I really like. And, and like I said, writing on games is, and I like a uh, happy console gamer. I like him because he's, he is happy and I've talked to him behind the scenes a lot. He's just genuinely a nice damn dude. Um, uh, metal Jesus rocks is another one that is just genuinely one of the nicest guys in the world. And I, I uh, those guys, when they cover a game, they like, and you can hear excitement. You hear the little yeah, chortle in their voice it. when they're like, G -g 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 -g. I love that. There's something about it where I'm like, dude, this person likes this game that uh, to me, that's the most exciting thing ever like that's what i like to that's what i like to hear and listen to oh my god it's like, i mean games are so cool though and to see the community riled up about stupid shit is just it's yeah. so unnecessary because it's like the games like you have everything at your fingertips why, why are you causing chaos like no stop it i i think when it comes to reviews too i will definitely say what i think and i would sit down in front of 100 people and still fight if i disliked the game and they liked it or what have you but i also do think that it becomes really weird like it can become weird really fast where, like I just said, the in the weeds, it, it depends on the discussion format that you're in. But yeah, you'll get sometimes where I'll see people arguing over something in a game. And I'll be like, we're still arguing about this, like one little thing. 
or somebody be mad that a character is a certain way or something like that. And I'll, I'll be like, but there's an entire game there. You should, you know, it's not just about that character or it's not just about this thing. It's about the entire, it, it, the entirety of it. I mean, I've had TV or TV shows or movies that I don't like one character in them. They just don't resonate, but the entire show is awesome. You know, I just, when that person shows up, I'm like, yeah, not, that's, I don't really like that person, but I'll sit through it because the entire experience is worth it in the end to experience that regardless you know, of the things I may dislike. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's one of those interesting things where you see kind of like the consumer mindset and not all consumers are like this, but whenever you see the consumer, right. some consumer mindset, whenever you get a comment or, you know, a, a post from somebody and you'll see where their brain is at and where they're focusing in. And I think the psychology of that is actually pretty interesting because that's where their laser is pointed to, not like right. the entirety of what the piece actually is, which is fascinating. Yeah. And the, especially luckily, I mean, the majority of what I get is, is uni like insanely positive, which I love. And we have a good discord that sort of is always there to bounce things off of. But what I've found that a lot of times I don't try to fix, if, if I notice somebody arguing something that's like, really, it just seems in the weeds too much. I usually just assume that they're probably not going to change and that I'll say, well, this is what I like. You might want to watch somebody else. I've had people so mad when I'll be like, oh, that's fine. Like somebody will say, I'm going to unsubscribe. And I'll be like, oh, that's exactly what you should do. Because when I started, I knew I wasn't going to be the only reviewer ever. That would be ridiculous. And I didn't watch the same reviewers all the time. I watched different ones. And if somebody wasn't resonating for me, then I switched. And I don't, but for whatever reason, people get really instantly Twitch, I'm going to subscribe. I'm going to unsubscribe. I'm going to unsubscribe. I'm, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to attack on this. I'm going to attack this little thing. It's very um, reactionary now. It's like almost instantly reactionary. It's why a lot of times I get shit for this. But during the podcast, a lot of times I'll say that whenever anybody gets really gushy to me, I get nervous because usually that means that person is highly emotional. And when I piss them off, they will go the exact opposite. And I've, it's something that I've told a lot of new YouTubers. If they say like, what's a piece of advice? I said, it's awesome when somebody loves your stuff, when they send you a long email and they, 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 you know, you helped them out with a bad time or whatever, but be aware that if some, if, if that's coming at you at a high degree, there's a chance that that person, when something, when they don't agree with it, they could turn that around and that exact same amount of energy times two, cause anger's about twice as easy as love. And they will just, you know, they will just lose their shit. And by the way, I'll always be like, dude, you realize it's a video game, right? There's wars going on. Like, this is a video game. Are you that mad about a video? Oh, yeah, I'm pissed. Okay, time for you to go. Go ahead. You know, come back nappy. later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need your nappy. <laughs> It's, it's kind of like there was something that a friend of mine said uh, a while ago, actually, of where if you're going to act like a child, I'm going to treat you like one. Don't don't yeah, act like a child. And the thing that sucks, too, is it's very difficult to understand where somebody's coming from on a tweet or written. And so I usually will, I'll usually just be like, okay, maybe it's a tweet and, you know, I'm reading it wrong. I told you that prior to the podcast where like late at night, I'm far more liable. I mean, it's even a joke amongst the YouTuber group I follow where they're like late night Carrick is way different than early morning. Carrick. <laughs> and that is true. Late night Carrick is, is insanely aggressive. And if I catch a lion on something or whatever, like I'll tweet about it and the next morning. I'll just be like, what am I, why did I do that? You know, it's just, the, it's just the typical thing. But when you get the feedback and I, I do think it's awesome to get it. I just think text is not very good. It's just, it's the same thing I have with articles. I don't read a lot of reviews because I find that when I read a review, I don't, I just don't get it. I don't get near as much as I do when I hear somebody, I told you, when you hear the little jiggle when they're excited or when they're angry or when they're frustrated but when you can hear that it's much better than a monotone you know today we will be talking about you know the last of us and you're like oh geez. you know it, it it's something about written just doesn't work so well for me it, it, on twitter on discord anything I, I have a really big problem with understanding tone in conversations a lot of the time mm. through text so it's very important for me to hear the person that's why whenever if i if i want to talk to someone over vc or over like some way that i can hear them audioly because if i can't then there's no way that i can properly get yeah through i a had a co-worker who works with me now not on the youtube channel works on something else but 
it, we had a rule at our job for six years and then eight years at the prior job, which is where I originally knew him, that we were not allowed to communicate via text. It, 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 there was no emails between us because his way of writing and mine are so dramatically different oh, wow. that it would lead to the worst miscommunications ever. And so for 14 years of working together, it might have been the second, I'd have to ask him, but it might have been the second year we were working together where we were like, this is not going to work, dude. We can't, it's not going to work because we agreed and we argued for two hours because we agreed. Like it makes, we just had such differing. And it's so funny because if you hear us talk, we, we don't talk. I mean, there's nothing, we don't have that in verbal, but in written, he'd write something and I'd be like, oh <laughs> yeah. And, oh. and then I'd write him and he'd be at his desk going, mm. and you'd get together and be like, I said this. So did I, we agree. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, what, you know, and you just, it, it, it just depends on the person and it depends on the tone, it depends on the form Twitter short, you know, so somebody can say, I didn't really like this. And you, you know, a developer I've seen developers lose their shit oh, yeah. from a tweet and later look at, I'll look at it later and go, I don't know if that person meant what that person, other person thought. I actually, now that I read it, I think that person might've been saying, I don't like, you know, what you did here, but I like all your games or whatever, but it sounds sort of cliffy, you know, where they're dropping you off a cliff with a one-liner comment. Yeah, you know, it's just, it's interesting in that way. It's a funny, and you know, it kind of goes in hand with the, the next topic I want to talk about of where, when we, we receive different negative opinions, I wouldn't call it negative is too nice of a word, actually. Um, bullshit opinions from people who really don't give a shit about us. <laughs> so it's yeah. really interesting to see those kinds of comments, but then to see the comments from people who really enjoy our stuff. And they always say, look at the nicer comments. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, if someone doesn't have thick skin or if someone isn't accustomed to a lot of like the constant berating and everything, it's going to be incredibly difficult, uh, difficult for them. What's your take on everything? Cause I know that, you know, you've told me even before the podcast that you receive a lot of stuff. Yeah. So we do the reviews and the podcasts. And whenever I get so the first thing I usually tell people is just continue to create, which is what I told you prior to the podcast. Like if, if you do a video and you don't like the feedback or whatever, do another video because memory is short. And that is I've had people come back and be like, I didn't realize I'd unsubscribe from you or whatever. I'm subscribed now. Thanks. And I'll be like, is that a shot? You know, what are they saying? But, you know, whatever. I'm glad they're back or, you know, have fun with whoever you decide to leave and watch. But the long term of it all is that I, I do believe that for the most part, um, people have a tendency. I mean, this is pretty normal. If you give somebody nine bits of positive advice and one negative one, they will focus on the negative. And that's simply because if you believe in evolution, we're looking for friggin', you know, wild animals in the bushes. So your brain doesn't care about the berries on the bush. It cares why the is the bush moving and there's no wind. That's a negative comment. And so people focus on them. I don't necessarily focus on them. What I do is usually just outcreate them or if there's something useful, there are times where somebody's trying to tell you something that they're having difficulty and you're having difficulty and you can't, you can't parse it through a YouTube comment. But then there's other times I've had people say, Hey, listen, when you used to do this, blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, Oh, that is actually absolutely true. But what really usually happens is this, you create a funnel when you create content of any kind. The funnel is one creator, two thousands of watchers. And there's a reason why one versus a hundred never works because there's a hundred coming in and there's one going out. You don't create that video for all 100. That would be impossible. You create it and there's going to be different forms of, of feedback. One of the things I usually tell people is to realize that if somebody dislikes it, it doesn't mean 10 people didn't you know, didn't love it. If somebody doesn't leave a comment, it doesn't mean somebody didn't watch it. You just sort of have to have a thick skin and realize that for the most part, um, there are people out there that are really genuinely trying to give you up the feedback. There's also people who give you too much positive feedback. Be like, everything you do is good. And you're like, I know everything. I do. Yeah, it's like, no. right. Yeah. In fact, you <laughs> sometimes don't trust that. But for the most part, I would say that people just need to, yeah, have a thick skin and realize that overall, it's all pretty, it's all pretty temporary and you create something. And if, if you get a hundred people saying something, then that might indicate either that video is not for a hundred people. And if they're subscribers, maybe you miss the mark, which is possible. It is absolutely possible. I've done a couple of videos that I thought were a cool new idea or some, and, and they just, people weren't even 
angry. Some just didn't comment. I would see the views and it tells you, you know, in YouTube, it always loves to tell you how shitty you did. And YouTube will be like, you know, only 3% of subscribers watch this. And you're like, well, that's low. Why is that? And then you go and you see a comment or two and you're like, oh, you know what? My viewers, those who would watch it and, and cause others to see it, this just didn't resonate with them. Not, not a mistake. It's literally not the type of video. And then you have to decide, do you create it for you or others? That's the other thing. Yeah, I create exactly. the podcasts because the honest truth is we call it the best gaming podcast because it sucks. Technically, <laughs> we have had so many issues. No lie. We've had over 50 podcasts have technical issues that can't that weren't posted. So a couple of days ago, we did a celebration of the 50, 500th podcast, but it was actually technically in the numbered line 450 because 50 total podcasts have gone wrong. So we decided let's call it the best gaming podcast as a joke. And it's actually just four guys that are friends. Nobody's an influencer. They're just buds. And we just randomly shoot the shit about games and, and news. And then at the end, somebody will be like, do you think reality is just a hologram? And we'll just go off on the random shit. That's also very useful for anybody who's dealing with negative negativity is to have some kind of outlet that they can bounce off of. And we, if you want to put it online, you do have to realize that sometimes it won't be for everybody. I do the podcast. It's not for my subscribers. It is some of them watch, but I can tell when I post a review or I post a podcast, I can look at the numbers and go, yeah, this is a, this is definitely not for the, but it's for me. And I can tell you the honest truth is I have become much more, uh, I it's, it's been a lot easier sometimes to jump into the next game by doing the podcast. Because when I get done Wednesday with Abzi's the guy that I do Wednesdays with, I'm, I'm just in a much better mood because we're just shooting the shit for a full four hours. And then Friday, I know when I wake up, if I have a review, it doesn't matter. I will skip an, or I'm not skip an embargo. I'll miss the embargo instant date to make sure I do the podcast because the podcast is so fun that, and it, and it's why I love games because these are four people that have nothing to do with the industry. And they're just like, dude, I played this game and it might be a game I hate. And I'm like, what the? And we just bounce off each other. And that's so important, even if I admit it's not for all my watchers. And you, you do have to sometimes realize sometimes you should stop and not continue to do that. And other times, maybe it's for you. And maybe you're just like, you want to talk about something that you, you want to get off your chest or you want to talk about. And you should post that video. You should not stop and just like hide it because I think that also, it doesn't harm you. But I think over time, it makes you question what you're posting, which I think think causes a lot of issues with a lot of a lot of creators. Yeah, exactly. Because I think that a lot of the time creators are posting things that they think that their audience is going to gel with and they're not really posting things that they're passionate about, which I yeah. mean, I started doing YouTube back in 2016. And even before the podcast, we were discussing like, you know, we've been doing YouTube for roughly around the same time. So it's right. really interesting to see like where my journey has led me in YouTube of where like I started doing makeup tutorials that were in line oh. with what games were. <laughs> like, oh, no, that's cool. Okay, I got you. I got you. Like I would take like a game cover and I would do the colors from the game cover as mm -hmm. a makeup look. Those right. videos are deleted. Nobody tried to look don't even try yeah Shh, don't even. worthless just you didn't hear anything and I, then i moved to doing like different skits because i would do like a freddy fazbear skit of he's haunting mm -hmm. my house and that unfortunately is still up on youtube um but whenever i go through sometimes and I do these they stick things, and you can't get rid of them right even though it i happens. see how like i act in certain videos yeah, and i right, see right. like the 23 year old self and i'm like oh no oh yeah <laughs> so, I mean, I saw the growth of everything going on through my channel for like almost what, 2000 videos now, I mm -hmm. think I have. Oh, damn. And that's good. <laughs> that's actually really good. Congratulations. That's a lot of videos. And it's cool that you didn't get uh, analysis paralysis is people do not realize YouTube tells you you're doing bad. So if you do a video you like YouTube, let's say nobody comments, YouTube is going to make sure you know. YouTube is going to be like, this is underperforming. Here's why, blah, blah, blah. And it's actually important that you continue to create. And so the idea that you've created 2000 is freaking wicked. I, ju I just checked right now. It's at almost 1800. So yeah. Okay. But <laughs> yeah, that's amazing because yeah. a lot of people, um, I think do at some point they stop trying or they, like you said, they start to focus a little bit, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's yeah. also 
nothing wrong with you doing something that you just l are liking to do. I mean, it's become to the point to where because it is a job, people think all your output needs to be of a very specific type just for the job. It's true in a way, but it's also true in a way that if you want to stay doing your job, you have to make sure that you're enjoying it. And especially in a creation situation, because I you said, you know, you know how to edit and stuff. Editing is rough for me. And and it's definitely the part I look towards and I love putting little in jokes in a review. But at the same time, I see Premiere open up and I just want to leap out the window. And so I have it almost every, I almost have the analysis paralysis every video I do. And that's why another reason why I like the podcast, no editing. So I can just be like, oh, let's just go not cut this stupid video to show the shield bash. You know, you're just like, oh, do you ever get stymied? Do you ever, do you like editing? I love it. It's a passion Ooh. of mine. I love it so much. That's why I always call, like, I always call myself the masochist jokingly because it's something of where I don't get angry at Souls games or Souls likes. I mm -hmm. love video editing to my core. Like, I've been doing video, if we're going to go, like, very specific and technically, I've been video editing since I was 14. Damn. Like, Damn. I, I love it so much. I did a high school project of where it was a stop motion film, and it was my first ever oh, project yeah. well, I did. Oh, yeah. There you go, oh, right there. If you did a stop so motion good. film. I got to see um, M Emma Krog. Yeah. Is that the claymation game? Came out I think so, yeah. Ago? I think it was. I got to see, I got to talk to them and we got to do a stop motion. When we went to GDC, they let oh, us make a stop motion five second video. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, it was cool for a second. <laughs> for a second. And then I was like, oh, damn. And so my friend who is more like really methodical on that stuff, I was like, hey, buddy, you want to move in this, this time? And I just walked off and then came back, you know, in two hours when the video was done. I was like, damn. So the fact that you did yeah. it is pretty impressive. That's, it's it's pretty, pretty insane. fun. I mean, for me, it's like, that's why I always approach YouTubers and I'm like, hey, if you need a video editor, I know this gets pretty time consuming. I'd love to do your videos for you. And most yeah. of the time they get really happy about it because everyone hates video editing. And I'm just like, I love this job. <laughs> Abzi ha, uh, had helped me a couple times. Unfortunately for me, no sponsors, which means not a lot of money, even with the huge. So if you hire an editor, depending on the time and all that stuff, you can lose money, especially if the game took you 60 hours to review. Um, so you're not making other creations. But I can tell you there have been times where I used to give him footage and there was like this wash of relief. And even when he was like, I don't understand what I should show at this point or whatever. And we talked about it. It was nice to just once that, you know, DM was done to be like, all right, I'm done. And it, it does. I, I will say it, it, the one nice thing and why most people should have editors is because um, I think it does allow as long as they have an editor that jives with them, because that can be an issue. I definitely I don't want to recall it, but I definitely talked to people who had some bad issues where they didn't gel and what they were trying to say and what they were trying to show. But if you can get a good one, it can out, it can increase your output, which then can possibly increase your income of things and your reward for things you do like doing, which then just makes everything better, which is really nice. I, w I wish I had it. Yeah, the first uh, company that actually really noticed my potential and took me on was Game Informer. And Alex- Yeah, I saw that. Such an amazing Yeah, dude. Alex is awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he yep. ended up messaging me and uh, and I posted a tweet. This was last year, I believe. And I was like looking for editing work. If you guys have any mm -hmm. like tips on what to do, he messaged me and I showed him like three of my projects and I was hired as a freelancer and I was just Damn, like, that's sweet. That's awesome. And what's so cool. cool is that that's the that's one of the reasons why whenever anybody says, should I do reviews or whatever? The first thing I say is <laughs> you've already wasted time by asking me. You should be creating something. <laughs> That's yeah. uh, everybody, uh, you'll get people who want it to be perfect. That'll never happen. Like, especially if you're new, but the idea that you like editing, one of the reasons why I like that is that I know a lot of people, unlike yourself, who likes to do both. There are a lot of people who do not like creating. They either don't want their face <laughs> or they do not want to review a game. They're like, I don't want to wow. review a game, but I want to say this or that. And it's cool that there are editors out there that they love that. And there's creators who hate it like me. And that usually if you merge the two, you can come out with something good. Not always, but it, it is nice that somebody's out there because I can't even see your side of the, of the conversation. I don't even understand how somebody <laughs> could like editing. And, and by the fine. way, I love it. And what's weird is I like it sometimes, but I, even when I get done, I'm like, oh, thank God I liked it this time. Exactly, Instead of saying yes. I like editing, I'm like, oh, this one time it was good. And then you back away from it. So. 
Yeah, I mean, like, it, uh, to be honest, and this is probably going to sound incredibly sarcastic, but I mean it with all my fiber. I'd have to like it after creating over 1,800 videos, you know? Yeah, true. So, yeah. So it's one of those things of where, like, and also it was an escape for me because, you know, going into a bit of a personal story, I am almost eight years sober. And, oh, good for you. Uh, Very yeah, cool. Thank you. And it's going to be this upcoming May, actually, that I'm eight years sober. And it was my escape. It was but around the time I graduated from college and that entire month that I graduated was just a big fucking blur because I was just like, no, I'm going to forget all this and we're going to move back to New Jersey and it'll mm -hmm. be fine. And recovering from alcohol is one of the most difficult and interesting points of my life because that was also the time I was starting YouTube and it allowed me to get fully into, I would say another mental addiction because yeah. I threw myself entirely into it. I was okay. Let me create. And I posted sometimes twice a day, every single day for a straight year until I moved to New York. Yeah. And I mean, it, and yeah, I think you're right that it, it, whatever, you know, there's some addictions that are better than others. And the idea that editing replaced it is always going to be a positive, you know, because I'm sure there'll be somebody who comment and be like, yeah, you're just replacing one with the other. Yeah, humans have a tendency to be addictive to something, even though, you know, some people can control it better. But there's always something out there. You have the friend who I, I have a tendency. So I'm very structured. I wake up at 3.30 every day, seven days a week. I don't ever change it. Like I work out every morning. There's So that's mine. But it it is it is cool to see somebody who sort of, Cr cr started creating because of another one and then comes into it and my entire you know m uh, much of my family are alcoholics and so when you do sort of see somebody who is that switch because you're not the only one i know who's jumped into something and it replaces alcoholism and it's almost always a positive regardless like even if somebody will say oh it's another day it'd be like yeah but it's a better one trust me <laughs> you know their liver is thanking them at the very minimum so um yeah, that's cool that you did it. I just looked so uh, totally I have 1400 and I would say that I was also posting twice a day many times or I was doing a weird thing where I was reviewing two games in the same video because I just loved game. You know, I love games. And then over time I sort of solidified in what I wanted to do. But that's the other thing. You did different stuff, I do different stuff. Like I said earlier writing on games, he does things differently. I do think there is a weird thing that occurs and I don't know if this has happened to you, but it blows my mind whenever this happens. And it happens often. If my review is not directly in line with everybody else's, people either say it's more honest or less honest. And then I have to remind them I'm an independent reviewer and you are watching me because I may not think the same thing as like a status quo group of people may think. And technically, I would say most other reviewers are that way anyway, even if they work at a, co a corporation, they're, they're probably independent for the most part. It is always weird to me because it happens a lot where people be like, you hated this game. Everybody loved it. And I'm like, exactly. What are you talking about? You just, you actually will say, that's why I like you because you like somebody will say, oh, Carrick's going to be honest, blah, blah, blah. He just says whatever he's thinking. And then they'll be like, oh, but you're not thinking in line with everybody else. So now I have a problem. And you're like, dude, you literally last week said, that's why you joined the you know patron or that's why you became, it's such an odd thing with patterns and the way people are. and. It's awesome to see somebody who's been able to create regardless of those kind of things that pop up. And I know I've had them too, where they sort of try, they sort of stymie me a little bit sometimes where I'm like, dude, can you win? And then I realize, no, you can't win. There's absolutely no winning. It's more just, can you continue? It's, that's pretty much what it is. It's like, and can you I've continue? had that that's exact same thing happen of where it's like, there was the first time it happened was back in 2019. And this is a time I will fully admit that I got death threats over it because I didn't think the way everyone else did over Fallout 3. And that was the first Fallout game I ever played. And Did you like I it or dislike it? Hated it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Absolutely hated it. And I went in and I thought that some ambiotic things were cool, some here, this and that. Apparently my camera wants to do the thing again. That's interesting. I I, I also yeah. I wasn't reviewing that. I don't I don't remember that. I have somewhat the same thing though with New Vegas. I was not anywhere near as big of a fan <laughs> of New Vegas as everybody else. And um it was I get why people have issues. I just death threats over a video game is great. Yeah. And it wasn't only like, that. Like I even said um because like 
Uh, I don't even know if I should men mention this, but you know what? Fuck it. If people have an issue with it, that's fine. I'm Jewish. So whenever I posted uh, that, you know, there was, was a poster inside the tunnel where you go in to see like the radio tower to find your dad. There was a poster in the tunnel that said, uh, gosh, I think it was be prepared for when the Holocaust comes or something like that. Yeah. And I was yeah. like. What? <laughs> a little off-putting <laughs> when you first see it. And not only that, the Chinese fail-safe program. When you go into there, you see like all these different characters mocking Mandarin. The only reason why I know that is because I know a little bit of Mandarin from my childhood. So you see yeah. all these different things that are being put into a game. And I'm thinking, did these developers care at all or think about the consequence years long that would happen? Because this came out in 2009. Yeah. Yeah, I think also... It depends on the game. I can't speak uh, very expertly about Fallout 3 because it's been forever since I played it. Oop, my light turned off. But I will say that um, I also sometimes wonder if they're, if a, you know, depending on what they're trying to sh do, are they trying to show the stereotype on purpose? So, because that's the mindset of whatever group you're in, which is like an apocalyptic world and these people have a bunker mentality against anybody else. Um, it's interesting you bring that up though, because I've definitely noticed. My wife's Chinese. And so there, there's been times where, you know, you'll be playing a game or whatever, and I'll, I'll hear something and be like, what now? What was that? And did you notice that? And, you know, depending on who's here and stuff and sort of ask them. But I don't think there's anything wrong. Like, obviously, you don't need me to tell you that. I don't think there's anything wrong with you, like, pointing that out. Because it also, again, shows you are your own person who's stating this is what I'm seeing. And what is always interesting to me is when somebody says, no, you're not seeing that. And you're like, <laughs> no, I, I am seeing I am. that. You know, <laughs> even if it doesn't bother me and it bothers you, different backgrounds, different sexes, all that kind of stuff comes into it. It actually it always interests me that people will champion the ideals and thoughts of independent whatever. And then the moment, like I said, if it if it doesn't connect with them, they suddenly have an issue with it. And you're like, that's oh, weird you react that way. Where will you be when the Holocaust comes? That was a quote from the poster. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And so. it, it's, <laughs> it's always, it, I, whenever I look at that kind of stuff, I always, especially with games that are handling, Fallout doesn't strike me as a game that handles too many like r real things because it's, you know, it's sort of like a magical post apocalyptic versus, say, uh, The Last of Us or something like that. What I've noticed sometimes too is that some people may not even pick up on things whether on purpose or not or subliminal on a developer's part or, or not because it also depends on the the way the game itself is presented and if they even see that like if they're even you know are they too busy shooting a bunch of bad guys or are they actually like looking at the things you and I look at and I've definitely had to do that in reviews where I'm like do I need to cover every minutia that m because like I teach martial arts if I see a move that looks weird do I need to say as a martial artist or do I need to say, oh, actually, as a martial artist? And it's awesome because two people who have almost the same background may come at that video game review in a different way. But regardless of how they do it, it still doesn't require a death threat. It doesn't matter. It, it, and it happened. It's happened to me. Like I said, I've had people threaten to come and burn and like poison my dogs or whatever because they hear the dogs barking during a podcast. And I'm always so stunned because I'm like, dude, you need to go outside. Because real life is happening right now. Like, this is a video game. And at the very least, I'm reviewing it prior to you even getting it. I've had people tell me I'm wrong prior to the game coming out. And I'll be like, dude, I'm playing, what? I'm playing the game. What are you talking about? You know, so it, it happens. It's unfortunate, but there's no filter. You know, YouTube has an age gate, but what does that mean? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. And it, yeah. it's interesting that before that you brought up New Vegas, because that was the only uh, Fallout game that I actually enjoyed. Um, I did two reviews of that game, actually. I did one review of it that was me messing around with the game prior to like all the bugs and everything crashing it consistently mm -hmm. on my PC. Um, and I also mentioned the racism there, you know, of where there was a perk called um, Sneering Imperialist, of where it was saying that we don't want any settlers on this land, uh, you know, and it was mocking indigenous people like crazy. And I'm thinking to myself, why is this even in the game? Yeah, it's supposed to be uh, kind of mocking those types of horrible people, but it's done in such a way of where it doesn't have any cadence. Where you not may, yeah, where you may not pick up on the cadence of it. That's yeah. actually interesting too, because with Fallout New Vegas, I liked it, but I didn't find it dramatically better than three. And the amount of really weird comments I get around Bethesda games is by far 
higher than any other game. No, maybe Last of Us might have more. But with I don't know what goes on with Fallout, Skyrim, and the fan because I'm a huge Bethesda fan since their original games. And it is a Daggerfall is probably top three games of all time for me. And it is so weird that they come out of the woodwork. And it, <laughs> it, it, it is so positive and negative. I've had people absolutely quit the Discord in a huff because Fallout 76, which I didn't review, but they were mad because people didn't like it. And, and, they, and they're one of the only groups, and I'm not dissing on Bethesda fans. I don't think it is actually Bethesda fans. In some way, I think there's something that happens with open world games and interpretations. And I've noticed that more with open world games. Uh, Assassin's Creed games. I've noticed this odd thing that occurs where there's almost more aggressiveness on both sides. No, it's amazing. No, it's awesome. Where like a game like D Dead Souls or, or Dead Cells, sorry, or something like that, I won't get that. But even if I don't agree with everybody else, but there's, I think it's open world games because one thing I talked to you prior to starting the podcast was investment is different than movies. When somebody invests so much time in an open world game, they are invested. It, it, even if they hate the game, they've invested hating the game, what have you. There is something about the investment of a long-term amount of time. Dark Souls, you could say in, in some way the same. And MMOs, where when you get that invested, things get skewy, man. And people start, the thought processes get really funky when you start talking about those games. Yeah, it, it's the same thing with Zelda games, man. Like, it's, it's yeah, so true. strange. Zelda games. No, it's you're so absolutely strange. right. It, I noticed yeah. it a little bit with Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, and that was less about Aloy, it was, it, it, which, which was interesting to me because I saw that on the internet. You know, I saw people complaining about it. I think most people who watch me probably know that I don't care and I, I like, I like those characters, but I, I think, I think it's absolutely open world games. I don't know how to describe this because I don't want anybody to think it's a negative, but do you ever find yourself like there's, well, you, uh, you sort of said it with dark souls. I, I found this with a game I reviewed a couple months ago. I'm not even going to say what one, but I was playing it and nothing emotionally was happening for me at all. Oh, and I'm not an emotional yeah. <laughs> person, but what I mean was there was no investment. There was nothing. There, it was weird. I, I yeah. And then something happened where I was sitting back and I was playing it. And I remember while playing it going, hmm, oh, oh. And I don't know what happened, but like everything that had occurred before made sense. And I don't know if everybody has that, but there's been times where I've been playing a game and I don't want to say it takes five hours to get into. I hate that shit. If a game takes five hours, that's on the game. That's the developer. That's the, they've screwed up. But have you ever had that where you have this like bump and you're all, oh, I like this game. Yeah. Now I get it. Oh, yeah. what, do you yeah. know a game? So it was Dark Souls, the very first one, because at first I absolutely hated it. And I was just like, why are the controls like this? What, mm -hmm. All the inventive thing. I was just like, why is the character so slow? Why am I doing fat rolls? All the things. And then it came to a point of where I was like, oh, the game wants me to play it by its rules. I can't think of any other game structure. I have to just focus on how this game wants me to yeah, play it. Yeah, that particular it. game wants you to play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was that one. There was also Alice Madness Returns. I mm -hmm. did not get it when I was first playing it. And I was like, uh, oh, okay. Oh God, that's really dark actually. But I love the beautiful morbidity behind it. It was great. Um, there was one I'm trying to think of right now. Um, oh my gosh, Little Nightmares. Little Nightmares? Yeah. During the first part of Little Nightmares, I was trying to understand it. And then it got to a point at where it was like emotional city. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting, especially because it's hard to define that to a, a, a person who's listening when you're trying to do a review and you're trying to explain like, it, it's not that it gets good, it's that you might notice that things don't necessarily resonate very well. And I do think it's okay to mention, I, like I, there's been games that I've said, this is definitely worth getting. I think it's a buy rating, but if you are a person that needs everything explained to you for the first couple hours, this may be frustrating for the first couple hours. It may just not make a lot of sense or, or fiction wise, it's not, it's world building at this time. And maybe the world, it, the world building just isn't great or something, but the entire world, the entire game is worth it, but it's really dip. Those are the reviews that I find myself thinking for a long time. Usually I'll go train, I'll go teach a class. And by the time I get home, I know what I want to say, but it will usually take longer on those games where I'll be like, Hmm, how do I, how do I define this? 
Yeah, exactly. And that's the way I was with my Dark Souls review, because I was thinking, how do I even go about explaining to people this experience that I just had? Yeah. Because now, like, because, uh, you know, kind of going on a tangent, I completely switched up my niche on YouTube, which was in and of itself a challenge of Souls and Souls-like content with reviews. And mm -hmm. now I can better explain to people that, okay, you need to understand that Souls uh, games in a general, even Souls likes, depending on the one that it is, they're not going to give everything to you on a silver platter. They're not going yeah. to say, hey, here's a story. We're going to give this to you. The only Souls game that ever did that was Demon Souls. That's it. Oh, was it Demon Souls? Yeah. Because it gave you the areas that you had to go to in order. You could literally do them out of order. Or anything oh, you wanted true. To. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that is true. Yeah, but true. it literally gave you the story at the beginning when you had to visit the monk in the very top of the tower and it laid out the entire thing. I'm like, this is a Souls game? <laughs> this yeah. is interesting. Yeah, because normally the mystery is is the juice in those games a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah normally I the mystery is within the that. items. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's where, I mean, that's their lore dump. That's actually one of the problems I have with Souls games. Um that I do have a little bit of an issue with their storytelling. I would like it to be a little bit more. I, I would like a little bit more. I don't know any other way to say it. There are times where I'm like, I do not want to read about a sword hilt, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes I would want a little bit more, but the, I think Elden Ring did a pretty good job in all ways, which I think that's one of the beauties of Elden Ring is that the number of people I know that are now Dark Souls fans or, you know, Sekiro or, um, or any of the others is because of Elden Ring letting them breathe a little bit. That's the other thing about Dark Souls. Those things are like, Spearman, he's going to kill you. And one of my friends used to always say, he's like, no, I died in the Spearman, like in the first three minutes. I can't, I think it's three where you start out and there's like a guy around a corner or something. This, my friend was just getting ruined. He was like, no, I don't even know. And what's funny is, especially when you teach martial arts, one of the things you'll hear is there is the ability to, you just overburden somebody and they can't learn. So they'll do something a thousand times wrong. And you'll, you go through the four steps of like, you know, not knew, knowing you're doing it wrong and not knowing why, and then doing it wrong and sort of knowing why, and then doing it exactly. right and knowing why, and then instinctual. Well, he wasn't anywhere. He was still at like, I don't even know what the fuck's going on. And then he did, uh, he did, uh, Elden Ring, and I, when I was talking to him about it, I said, of all things, come out of the cave. You have four You have four basic ways in which you can travel. Instead of running out there, watch the guys and just sort of decide where you want to go. Go a little slower. That was the beauty of Elden Ring, is it just wasn't so in your face instantly that I saw a bunch of my friends, a bunch of YouTubers, a bunch of Discord uh, people in my Discord who learned, who, who, we're able to understand it more because there was a moment of like respite just a bit where they were able to sit back and then do something or run, which was a nice thing because a lot of the dark souls games are like, here's a Valley and you got to go through it. And there's 15 guys and hello. And you're like, what the shit? And in that game, it was like, here's an open plane sort of decide what you want to do. And you see a guy and you think, Oh, the guy on the horse, I can take him. And the guy smokes you 16 times. And it, that's, that's what I, that game is really a testament to, I think them learning too, because everybody says like, oh, Dark Souls, blah, blah, blah. They do get better. They uh, obviously, I think they've got better from one, two, three and, and that stuff. But then you get Elden Ring and you're like, oh, they like, they did a really good job. They did a really fantastic job in that game. It's interesting that you bring martial arts into the conversation because I used to do Taekwondo. So hearing mm -hmm. that brought up is like, ah, memories. I love it. I made it up to like senior green belt before I got my knee injury. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is probably yeah. the number one occurrence in all martial arts is knee injuries anyway. Yeah. No, I dislocated my, my knee mid, uh, when, like when I was going in, uh, it was you know, a complete side story. I was going in for like a senior picture photo shoot and I had felt something going on with my knee. I put my boot over it. As soon as I sit down to take the picture, knee like makes this oh, clicking pop. crack sound mm. and I dislocated yeah. my knee completely. So I went in to tell my uh, martial arts instructor for Taekwondo. I was like, Hey, I don't think I could fight. And they were like, you could do the upper body sword stuff. And I'm like, Maybe. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. like, no, you're Sucks. not supposed to do that. But it's fun, though. You know, it really is. And doing that in accordance with Souls games, it makes a lot of sense to do a comparison to that because it's mind over matter, right? Because yeah, when you're going into a Souls game, you have to really think about what approach you need to take before you go into anything.
Yeah, and I think a lot of people also, you'll hear people say that Souls games are more realistic. As somebody who's trained in sword, I can tell you, no, they're not at all. <laughs> but what they are is more demanding and more, um, they're more punishing. And so the one mm -hmm. nice thing about Elden Ring is that that punishment is meted out at a slightly slower pace at first. And there's yeah. more control over that pace. Neo, I, I love, but Neo's the same way. I'm, Neo 2, I remember getting out and starting Neo 2 and being like, oh my God, you know, you come out of a cave or something. There's bad guys already. And I'm like, uh, here we go. I sort of know how this is set up. <laughs> but it is nice. I think they did a really good job. And it's awesome to see a company take a chance because I don't know of, it's not that the company took a chance. It's that I think they just continue to make games they want to make. But <laughs> that exactly. game is... Um, it's not like special in my heart or anything, but I saw the de I saw the developers realize that they could continue to be iron clad and say, Dark Souls 4 or Elden Ring, it's just going to be <laughs> valleys and you going through it and getting stomped. But instead they were like, you know what? If we allow people a little bit of pause, we might get other consumers who would never want to do those games do them. And that it, yeah. it's fantastic, man. That's why this one was so beginner friendly for a lot of people. Why a lot of my yep. friends actually got into Souls games to begin with. When I got into Elder Ring, um, I actually saw the trailer. I reviewed it, hated it because I thought this is like every other magic thing that I saw. And that's mm -hmm. how I got into Dark Souls was because one of my friends commented. She was like, try Dark Souls 1. You're going to love it. This was back 2021 before Elden Ring's release. I'm like, I'm going to give it a go. Bit my words real fucking fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done that too, where there's a game also when it comes to reviews, not just you were asking about categories, but there's sometimes where you see a game and it's, you're just like, I don't know if I even, if it speaks to me in any way. It's been nice to have surprises though. There's definitely oh, been, yeah. Life is Strange was a huge surprise for me because as a 40 year old man, I never wanted to be a 17 year old girl, oh. but Life is Strange is one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah. And so to play it, I was like, oh shit, this is insanity. It's I love heavy. everything about this game. And, um. That was actually really cool to be surprised like that. It's nice to be surprised because you see a Final Fantasy and I think most of us know what a Final Fantasy will be. So when I saw when I see some game that I don't know what it'll be, a lot of times there's a little apathy where I'm like, eh, I don't know. But I've actually found myself asking for those codes because I'm like, you know what? This might end up being a surprise. And I would say most of the time they are pleasant surprises, which is really cool. It's interesting you say that because that's how I felt about... Um... Oh God, I'm forgetting the name now. Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. Years ago, oh, yeah. I did a playthrough of it on my channel. I had never played Red Dead Redemption 1. Someone sent me a code for it. It was just a subscriber and they were just like, I really want you to play and review this game. Can you do it? Long game. It took me through so many different emotions. It was so well built. It's still one of my favorite games to this day. Are you a one or two? A two. Have you done one? Never did one before. Yeah, one's my favorite game of all time. and. Two is awesome, but I will say the one thing about two is, is that they definitely really leaned on the simulation stuff sometimes too much. I remember when I got done with the review, I was like, I love this game. It's great. I didn't like the first two or three hours in the snow. I wanted to die. It was so long for me. But when I got walking around and Arthur, you know, we were talking about animations. Arthur moves so slow and he's just glacial. And you're like, oh my God. But Rockstar has a certain feel to their games. Every one of their games has been different. And they're one of my favorite developers. But man, if you play L.A. Noir, uh, well, that's not them. If you play Bully and then you play Red Dead and you play some of their other games, all their games feel so, it, it's so weird, but they actually feel dramatically different. And Red Dead 1, when you play Red Dead 1, it, it is a little slower on the movement. John's a little slower, but then you play 2, it feels really different from 1. It's really an interesting jump. Yeah, because a lot of sequels will still have there's something about the tone and atmosphere that's the same, but the movement and the way it feels almost feels, and this is not going to the first person. I'm not talking about the first person viewpoint. I'm saying staying in third. It's pretty interesting to see how much they changed. It still feels like their game, but they definitely, there's a, there's such a different feel in Red Dead 2. It feels like a movie that you're playing at times, yes, which I think can be slow for some people, but for me, it was pretty awe-inspiring and it's beautiful and it's old and it still looks better than, 99% of games out there, which is, I mean, probably a sign of the money they spent, but still it's, it's crazy good. I love I that. Do, I do have to ask going back to Elden Ring for a second. Are you excited about the DLC? So, uh, so there's two sides to me. We, we just discussed this on podcast cause I'm trying to decide to review it or not. And one of the big problems is 
if you have a bunch of games coming, grabbing an old game and getting good at it again and injecting that into your time frame is quite difficult. And you want to be good. This happened with Surge 2. It had some DLC that was about out of the third way through. And it was difficult to go, oh my God, so I got to get good at it again. Good enough to be able to do the DLC, which he said was going to be quite challenging in and of itself. And so I'm excited for it because I liked Elden Ring, but I don't know. I, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to set aside the time because I do think as a reviewer, you should be, if you're doing the DLC, you need to be pretty good at the game to beat it, I guess, already, and then do the DLC and I'm not there anymore. I mean, I haven't played Elden Ring in a long time. So the idea of turning on an Elden Ring and being like, all right, I need to find space in my review time to get good at the base game even. And I have people on my Discord today, there were six people streaming Elden Ring, and they were all <laughs> doing it to get ready for the DLC. And I was like, damn, I don't know if I have the time. So I'm I'm very excited for it, but I'm not, I don't know about the coverage. I, it'll be a quite a unique experience because that, some of the stuff that they were talking about looks awesome. But at the same time, that's a chunk of time. That is a serious chunk of time to get back into if you're like me who doesn't return to it. I, I haven't returned to it. See, I am a complete, I, I will fully admit, I am a complete whore for Elden Ring in my all my entirety. Like that game, I am so excited about it. I saw the trailer, I squealed like a little girl. I was so massively ready for it. The fact that it's coming out June 21st of this year, I even thought that is really soon. Like I, I thought it would be out by the end of this year to be completely honest, but seeing all the artwork for it, seeing the way that some of the characters were seeing a potential boss and the fact that they made a collector's edition for a DLC, that's a lot. Yeah, they, um, I'm just shutting this so the dogs don't bark. They did, they, it is, okay, so it's weird that you say, not weird, but it's different that you say that it's early. I actually wished it was last year in a weird way because I, it, it is a big DLC. It's $40, which I think is completely valid. Like I have no issue. In fact, I love different DLC prices and sizes. I always have been a fan of expansions too, but, um, I, I think that this late, there are a lot of people facing the same thing I'm facing just as players, which is that there's a lot of games and there are a lot of really high scoring, good games from last year that people have not even turned on yet and ignoring good scoring games. There's poor scoring games. I know many of my friends still want to play. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's scored at 50. So I'm, a lot of my friends are like, I still want to play the game. What the hell? So it's interesting that I guess you're right that it probably seems more like a fall game. But I think also we're, we've gone away from releasing in the fall, like the old days, the November, October, you know, hit the hit the Black Friday. And instead, they've all I mean, they're everywhere. Look at February. February's for the last God. three years have been ridiculous <laughs> yeah. to the point to where Horizon Zero Dawn and Horizon Forbidden West PC port. I genuinely feel bad for that company. They have never released a title without a major title at the same time ever. Not one time. So no. all the Horizon games have released with a Zelda or Elden Ring, or a DLC, or something big, and now they're releasing two days prior to Rise of the Ronin and Dragon's Dogma, or something, or it's in that oh, time I frame. Oh, I forgot about that. That's ridiculous. Yeah, like, there is a three-day window, I think, that we were looking at game releases, and I was all, and now, as a reviewer, luckily, they know, too, the PR guys. So they'll know, and they'll try to get you code early, so that you can cover them all, but still, as gamers, Jesus, trying to it's jump tough. into... Dragon's Dogma is going to be like, and it's one of my favorite games of all time. So like that game's going to be huge. And Rise of the Ronin looks, at least from what I'm seeing, looks like it's stepping up. So Elden Ring is releasing, the DLC is releasing at a pretty good time, I think, for them. Um, but I would agree, it probably is more of a fall game. And we don't know what's coming out in fall. So maybe that would even be a better time. But I think they're, they have so many purchasers who are instant. They're like Nintendo fans. Oh, yeah. And, and the thing is, so, too, is that June is shaping up to also be a, a rather chaotic year because you have uh, Elder Ring DLC coming out on 21st. Yeah. Also, on the same day, there's a new game, Intoria, the uh, last, I think it's Intoria, the last song is a new uh, Souls Like that's coming oh, out. Same oh, day damn. as the Elder Ring DLC. So here's the other thing. I don't know if you've noticed, but as a reviewer, there's been a lot in the last year of companies DMing me and saying, what do you think about moving the title? Now, they're not asking me personally. They're asking a group of people, I'm sure. But I think that's very smart. I think it's very, Baldur's Gate moved forward, right? Baldur's Gate moved, I think, a week forward or a week after. I can't I remember. So, yeah. so we're getting companies who are smart. And I am just going to be honest. I would not be surprised if Forbidden West, even though it's a PC port, if maybe they just decide, 
hey, we're going to slightly adjust our release time because there's so many games. You can buy all the games instantly if you have the money, but you can't play them all. You no, can only play one at a time. You'll have yeah, unlimited so time there, to do anything with. Yeah, you've got, you know, there are people with unlimited money and I have friends who buy every game and I'm like, dude, I have to decide what games to buy because I buy all the games. So there are some reviews I haven't done and people got all mad. And I'm like, dude, I didn't have the $60 to like add on to the other games that I bought. But yeah, it is, it is crazy. Last year and this year have been almost negative in the amount of releases where I think there's a little bit of, at least I see it in my discord. And I certainly see it in my uh, comments where there's been a, not a burnout at all, but a, a hold back of people buying stuff because there's too much. And I'm starting to wonder if that's going to continue to boil out, ignoring recession and stuff. I just mean sheer absolute analysis paralysis where there's so many old games and new well, games. If we see an October like we did last year, I think there might be, to be completely honest, because October of last year, you had Spider-Man 2, you had Alan Wake 2, you had all right. sorts of games coming out at that time. And I feel like, yeah, Halloween's a great time to release certain types of games, but at what cost for not only the, you know, the, uh, the company, but the consumer as well. Well, did you ever, do you do Ubisoft games much? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, one game that I found really interesting recently was Avatar. So Avatar is beautiful. It's beyond beautiful. Wow. It's one of the best. Ex it's one of the best engines I've ever seen. And luckily, they've replaced the Far Cry engine with that. So moving forward, oh, they'll nice. be using the new engine, which is nice. Yeah, Ubisoft has six engines. They need to have three. Like they're, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Yeah. But Avatar, regardless if people love it or hate it, Avatar got a really odd thing that I was noticing, where some journalists were covering it early and saying it's identical to Far Cry, which it isn't. It's not even in the same engine. It's not even the same setup in a lot of ways. And then some were later, which I found really interesting. Some were getting it later because there were too many games and they were buying it three, four or five weeks later. And they were saying, oh my God, I'm glad I didn't sleep on this game. And when I talked to a couple, uh, a couple reviewers who had done it late, I asked them and they said, even they were out of time and they only played four games. So if you know, consumers, you know, I, there, there's people who buy way more than four games. So if even the journalist is like, dude, this is my job. This is my this is my actual job and I didn't have time makes me it makes me wonder how much more we can continue to push because some of these games are also bigger. I mean, Baldur's Gate alone was ridiculous. Like that was Baldur's Gate massive was almost stupidly big. And I honestly firmly believe that Act three paid a huge penalty um, versus one and two. I three was clunky as shit. And it, it did point, not feel, yeah. oh, sorry. I was just no, going to no, say it didn't yeah. feel anywhere near as, uh, as, as well, as uh, well established and feeling as the plot and the mechanics as two, one act one and two did. Oh, I completely agree. And to the point of where I feel like the story even suffered a lot in the final yeah. act as well, because you go through act one through this building up and then you get to the crescendo of act two, and then you get to the final thing and you're there, you're with the nether brain, you're doing everything that you need to do. And it's like, Okay, this was cool, but it also feels like a massive letdown as well because you're you're seeing everything building up to this really massive point yeah. and you're going through two phases. And you're not seeing like a cutscene interact with those phases like you would in the previous acts. That's exactly right. And that's one of the things that um early access I know everybody loves, but you could certainly tell that early access was only act 1 and those parts and then you started getting to the other parts and I liked Baldur's Gate a ton. But there were definitely moments where I was like, wow, this might be, it's not that it's too big. It's just that it is that big. And then you have these other games that are big. It just feels like gamers themselves who want to play everything, even if they have all the money, there's, they have jobs. They're not, I mean, we're getting to this stupid amount and they're all good. A lot of these games are also very good, which that, I mean, that means somebody's going to put them on their plate to play. And it just seems like we're getting to a release pattern that seems really hard to continue without some without some change. And I don't know if that's companies changing their release. Um, you did see that Namco and Square both changed their release schedules, right? Oh, did you yeah. see that? Yeah, news? I saw that. Yep. By the way, admitting they made somewhat poor games, which I thought was funny, where they both stated, <laughs> we've decided to change and make more quality games. And I was like, it's like <laughs> that friend who tells you they're gonna finally be nice. And you're like, so we're in agreement, you're a dick. That was really <laughs> weird. True. But if you notice Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, Namco, Square, a, a lot of these big companies are making these vast changes very quickly. And I am wondering if they're all looking at the same future 
when the Embracer deal failed, that was uh, the Saudis who were going to inject money. They didn't, that wasn't just the investment cash first payment. It was, it's called an investment for a reason. They were planning on growing gaming. That's not happening anymore. So I'm wondering if we're going to get, if there's going to be something there where we start seeing people delay their games and or move the games or, or pay more attention to one another's release timing and move them around. Yeah, and not only that, like once you pay attention to the release and the timing of it all, other things can start to be improved within different games. Accessibility yes. can get a better shot. You know, different things, like even for the Elder Ring DLC, I really hope that they fix the fonting because for me, like I get vertigo and I get uh, dizziness very easily with certain games. Like that's why I did not like Dead Space as much as I wish I could have right. because my vertigo got really bad in the, um, uh, what was it? The limited gravity areas. So when I look at the font size on certain points in Elden Ring, I'm like, it's fading into the background. You guys got to do something yeah. about this. And yeah, you got to even... step it up. We I've covered ac accessibility and a ton of stuff. I think that, and I, I review it a lot of times, depending on, it, especially if they're reaching out and trying to do something a little bit cool, you know, where they're trying to add not just colorblind, which is great. But I mean, we're getting to the point now where it's sort of stupid, where that shouldn't even be celebrated, should be expected. Yeah, like that's the bare minimum. It is nice to see a lot of them. Microsoft doing their their um their controller, Sony doing theirs, but we still do see these guys do not understand font sizes no. at all. And they do not understand <laughs> no. when somebody's got a 60 inch TV or a 4K TV and they're sitting way away from it that when their font size is this big, they're not gonna be able to read shit on the screen. And yeah, that that's definitely a thing. It's it's nice to see a lot of companies doing it though. I mean, Naughty Dog's definitely done really well, and so Spider-Man 2 did really well. So we're seeing it more games. Microsoft is actually, you know, I know a lot of people love to hate them, which is always weird to me, but Microsoft has actually, I've been really impressed with a lot of the accessibility stuff they put into their games or are trying to put in. They sometimes, it's different developers. So I understand it's not one overarching, but sometimes you'll get a game where you're like, this doesn't have as many, but I do like that we're seeing it from the big guys. Cause I think the, the smaller companies will try to do it just the same. It's awesome to see. Yeah, even with Santa Monica Studios, they're really upping their game with a lot because you saw God of War Ragnarok and even just God of War yeah. 2018, how much better it was. Yeah, and as somebody who gets motion sickness instantly, like instantly, oh, I get it beyond. But yeah, and it's um, I also have noticed a lot of companies, not everybody has allowed for turning off head bob and stuff and head bob and all those kind of move extra animations. Yeah, they look cool on a trailer on TV, but some people don't want to play where the character's jiggling their head and you're sitting yep. <laughs> going, why is my screen moving all? So I that's accessibility too. Anything that allows some, and that's the thing I'm sure is a you know, Dark Souls person, you hear this all the time, but difficulty versus accessibility because they are, yep. one's, one does it allow you in, the other is your progression continually within it. And it, they are yeah. merged, but sometimes they're also different. And I do, you know, you fall into the discussion where somebody would be like, you should add a difficulty, you know, an Ugh. easy difficulty. And I'm like, that's not necessarily the same always no. as an accessibility, which would allow somebody to get into it. And the people that I know, because I deal with a lot of people who have uh, war wounds and you'll, you'll, you'll talk to them about and I'll say something like, well, you can turn it to easy mode. <laughs> and I can tell you, boy, that's not what you want to. You did, I'm going to no. tell you right now, that's not what you want to say to somebody. And Eight. that's the that's the thing that I do see that people are getting confused or not confused, but there's some there is there's something that's happening sometimes where they're like, we'll just add an easy mode or we'll just allow this. And I'm like, that's not they don't get it, though. That's the, the thing. Yeah, don't it's know not the, the same definitions. thing. Yeah, it's not the same thing. Oh. But luckily, both companies, uh, well, all three companies are working with people in that way. And Dark Souls, those kind of games, there's trying. I don't know how you do accessibility in Dark Souls uh, for some things. The Dark Souls is like, it's not accessible anyway. <laughs> like it, What's interesting you know, it's, though is that like, I try to tell people that the, that the thing is like, there's a clear indicator of there's a difference between accessibility and ease of playability. That's yeah, a big yeah. thing. Like, and it, to, to go back on the, you know, Dark Souls, like the, the accessibility would be in like the font sizes, like basically yeah. having a mode for people who physically are not able to play the game. But it, for me, like I had this conversation with someone in my comment section uh, during the Fighting Hellboy podcast that I did of where there was someone literally disagreeing with me about the fact that they don't want disabled players in order to have it because you're treading a fine line with not with having accessibility for those who can't play it right and i just stopped commenting because it's like you, literally the person was being as ableist as possible and it was gross 
Well, and not only that, but I, it, I just had a funny discussion with a guy in the podcast who was like, I don't want any controller. I don't want games on PC to be controller to allow for people to play it with controller. And I was like, wait, what? And he's we, we tease him all the time. He's a very funny, old, grumpy guy. But we always joke about it because what he was saying was actually valid. It's just he said it in the world's worst and like <laughs> most brain dead way. What he was trying to explain was he didn't want developers to uh, to create the HUD and the inventory based on a controller and the controller's buttons versus a mouse and keyboard. He's absolutely oh, right. Geez. And we have seen games where that has happened, where you play a game on the mouse and keyboard and you're like, why is the menu set up like this? And then you oh realize, oh, it's made for a mouse. It's made for the game pad, <laughs> but they didn't adjust it. It was so funny because he said it and we were just like, dude, what? That makes no sense. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah, because he was also complaining he didn't want crossplay. Because I'm a huge, like, I think crossplay should be in everything. And he's like, yeah. I don't want this, blah, blah, blah. It was so funny because he actually had very good points, but all those points really went down to what we were just talking about, which is the developer making sure the options are in there. And right, he exactly. didn't want them to be removed. He didn't want, so I get what this person is saying. The person I was talking to had an actual point, um, which was that, you know, you don't want the entire thing to change for the controller, but it is all stuff that accessibility people do work on. And I do love that. And I do love that we're starting to get like all of those options in there. But what I don't know about, and I still don't have a position on this, is difficulty in some games. I've heard people say this game has no difficulty. You see a lot of games with dynamic difficulty. And then you see people saying they need to add an easy mode or blah, blah, blah. And I still don't know how I feel about that because I'm also okay with games saying this is the game. Like this is the, this is the game. And there isn't an easy mode. It is just dynamic difficulty. And even I've had problems on some games, you know, where you play a game, you're like, damn, this game's schooling me. You know, what do I need to do? I don't know. I don't know. Like, what do you think? Do you think like, so do you think, do you, do you want, do you like the idea of adding a difficulty like level to every game, even if it is a Dark Souls style? Do you think it's just better to just say, hey, we're going to have an easy mode and cut their health? Or do you think it is actually some games are just not going to have it. I think some games are just not going to have it. I mean, for me, yeah. like when I was playing Thymesia, that Souls-like game, that was a really yeah. breath of fresh air to see an indie game actually go in, bite the bullet and say, you know what? No, we're creatively going to make this decision. And, right. you know, right. I fully believe, and I mean this with my whole heart, I say it almost every podcast, every person who is able-bodied, I know can finish for a fact a Souls and Souls-like game. They are really, it honestly comes down to if you want to play the game and if you practice enough and if you just have the, like the, you put the ego aside and just admit to yourself like, okay, I'm not good at this. Let me try to practice it to get good. Right. And people always equate with getting good to like being mean or taunting. It's like, no, actually it gets twisted around. What getting good means is that no, like a big brother or a big sister, we're like, no, you just get good. It's okay. You can practice. You'll get better at it. Yeah. But it turns into this big, really unnecessary taboo conversation around it. It's like, yeah, these companies deserve to have their creative freedom. They deserve to have their, you know, what they want in a game, have the accessibility, have people who cannot actually physically play the game, have a special thing for them. That way they can right. play the game. Someone who's colorblind, someone who has, uh, you know, uh, who cannot see that well or has difficulty seeing, you know, something like that, but keep the same difficulty for those who are able-bodied, keep that for them. It doesn't change anything in the game whatsoever. Yeah, and I think also, when I look at it, I'm always under the impression that um, this is just my personal opinion, but sometimes devs are asking people way too much. I don't see a lot of novelists phoning in or doing a tweet saying, hey, guys, what do you think of these first 10 chapters? Usually they say, here's my book. And exactly. Yeah. It's sometimes I'll, I'll see a developer or even I've been asked to do a mock reviews, which I don't know if you've ever been involved in those, but where a company will say, hey, do you want to do a mock review? And usually I don't want to do it because I want to do the full review and doing both would be anti every moral in the world. So it's like, I usually choose the end result review, but there's been times where they've said, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'll, I'll honest, I'll, I'll give my opinion. Cause they're just asking me. Sometimes I'll see a tweet where somebody, you know, early access game or whatever. And sometimes I'm like, you know what? It would be nice to just have them say, here's my game. That's it. And, and the free market will will take care of the rest. Like here's a, you know, because I do, I, I definitely see some people pulling back. Some developers are definitely pulling back on some stuff. 
And I'm a little bit, I don't really want that. It's like, I don't think every title needs to have early access to get feedback. And we know early access for some things are ripoffs. I mean, you can tell almost where you're like, yeah, I don't think this game's ever coming out. They'll be like, oh, we need to talk to the community. And you see that all the time on early access. I'll open up Steam and I'm sort of, I'm not necessarily anti-early access, but I'm starting to see this trend of that bullshit where it's just more like pay now for barely anything and we'll give you something later. And a lot of times I'm just like, can you just make the fucking game? Can we just like get the yeah, game? Just release it. That's fine. Just release it and we'll we'll figure out from there. I I, I don't want developers to feel like they have to... Um, kowtow especially early because i also think it sometimes it it fucks up the develop the development process completely you know where sometimes they have an idea and then everybody's like oh i don't like that idea but it's like do you not like the idea or the end result in the game a year from now which might be a fantastic different and unique game which is by the way the same thing those people would be bitching about not getting they'll say we want unique games a unique game will come out people like mm -mm. and you're like dude you just said you just said you want unique games and now you're saying you don't want it's just an odd thing that goes on with gaming i think i don't know you don't see movie directors saying hey i'm going to develop doom you guys want to come and see half of it and tell me if the <laughs> what i need to do it's like what the fuck no i don't know yeah no martin scorsese is going to ask yeah. people <laughs> yeah can you imagine yeah 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 <laughs> quentin call people up yeah, like, yeah making a movie you want to come over and see the first half and tell me what i should do like no Tim Burton, i do i do get the idea yeah, I do get the idea for sure of support for some games. They just don't have the money, you know, and you get, and I, I fully get that. But I do see it a lot of times. And I've talked to a couple devs where there was really no reason to do the early access. It was more along the lines of just, you know, sort of seeing how people would react early and deciding from there. And I'm like, oh man, I don't like, I do not like the idea of that going forward. That seems really dark as a future if all of our games are three levels of a 16 level game. And they just sort of grind out the rest, but we've got successes from it too. I mean, Baldur's Gate obviously being one. We don't. That's one, true. One of yeah, where you know early access was actually put to good use. Uh, I honestly think that the we don't by nature. It's not necessary to have a ninety-nine plus hour game. There's some instances Absolutely. of where it works. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. There are some instances of where it works, like Baldur's Gate. There are other instances, like <clears throat> Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Where it doesn't work out so well. I mean, yeah, I and you played... know what's funny? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, I, I, I was just gonna say you're you're right about Baldur's Gate in particular. Like that one worked out. Uh, we've seen others work out. We've seen games that are super long. I do think um, with Valhalla, the really interesting discussion around Valhalla that stuns me. Valhalla has sold beyond belief. Oh yeah. Un <laughs> unlimited sales, like two point one billion in sales, like ridiculous. So someone liked it a lot. And what does interest me is that that game is very long. It's only it's only about nine hours longer than Odyssey, which is my favorite of all of them. But it's got it's got that it's got that open world, you know, Ubisoft bloat that we see. But it it is interesting to me that sometimes that's okay, and then other times it's not. And you'll see it, it just depends on the game. It depends on its length. I would like to see a lot of these games shorten up a little bit. Um, but then you get Call of Duty Modern Warfare's campaign, which is shorter than my podcast. My pod, we do podcasts, and none of our podcasts in the last two years have been sh have been shorter than that campaign. The campaign was shorter wow. than the podcast. Yeah, so it's, uh, you do get that right. So it, it's just it depends on each game and how they put it together. I, I think Baldur's Gate was thick enough that you felt rewarded no matter what. The, the sense of reward was high enough in Baldur's Gate that even though it was that long. But I do know a lot of people who just won't play it and who want to, who are just like, mm, that's, I mean, that's, it's, un, it, I could play 10 games easily in that amount of time is what they're telling me. And so they don't want to jump in. So there's an, I, I like that it's a one of a kind though. Really, what other game other than MMOs are that long? So, you know, I'm, I'm okay with the occasional game being that big. I think Ubisoft games have a tendency to be huge and I'd like to see them shorten them up. But at the same time, I feel like I might be wrong on that. I really honestly do. Uh, listeners, for you and me, we are funneled because we talk about games and we do reviews. So the people watching this podcast will probably agree with us. But there is a contingent who bought that, a massive one, who might not agree. And that is actually fascinating to me because 
I have a lot of very new gamers in my Discord who are 16 to 25, let's say, you know, and their first system and first Assassin's Creed was Valhalla to them. Do you know Same what Valhalla is? Valhalla is amazing because it offers 150 hours for 60 bucks. So there is a very big split that's going on. And I talked about it in a video I did where I was like, I know that people funnel to me to talk about old stuff and new stuff and compare a game to the prior Assassin's Creed, blah, blah, blah. There's a contingent of people. Thankfully, people have sex. So people are born every day. And those people are coming into the industry every day. And so when I talk to somebody, I have to now in my reviews, I do it all the time where I'm like, if this is your first blah, 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 then maybe this. But if this is your fifth Assassin's Creed, then maybe this. And it, it sucks because it extends the review, but there is a huge number of people that Odyssey and Origins and Valhalla are Assassin's Creed. There is not an Assassin's Creed prior at all. There, there's no experience. That's, and so <laughs> that's what? wild to Go think ahead. about. That is so wild to think about. Yeah. Because Assassin's Creed Valhalla was my first Assassin's Creed. Oh, well, there I you go. Believe. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it was it was so crazy to think about because it's like when you're saying that and like seeing like oh yeah 16 17 year olds this is going to be one of their first games that they're going to play it's like oh my god not only do i feel old but that's so true because you're seeing the trends of what's going to be popular and the hours played going to be different as time goes on yeah and um and it it's i want as I want a company to pare down their stuff let's say and i'm because i've played 15 assassins creeds but then Technically, what I might be saying to a newcomer is to give them less return on their investment, which is a very weird discussion to have. And it's a discussion that it's like, I think we can both agree if there's two people discussing that maybe what we're really saying is to pare it down and make it make more sense, make it fill back into the story. That's stuff that we expect. But it is a discussion I'm having consistently because we do have a lot of new, uh, uh, I don't know why, but my Discord my YouTube subscribers, my patrons are younger age, or I'm getting a lot of younger ones. I don't know exactly why. And they are all saying the same thing that Baldur's Gate is long. So they're getting a return on their investment and, and maybe they've only got 60 bucks or an Assassin's Creed to them. When I complain about the movement or something where I'm like, eh, you know, Bayak or Boriak, as I call him, I know everybody else liked him. I wasn't a fan of that guy, but his movement feels this way somebody else is like what the fuck are you talking about what do you mean because i haven't played i have no clue what's syndicate and i'm like it's the best fucking assassin's creed game. Well, to me i loved it and i'm trying to explain it to them and they're like dude i have no clue what the fuck you're talking about at all so could you just tell me if the game's worth it and they have a absolutely valid point and so when you review a game man especially in the last five years i have really tried to be like okay as a newcomer zelda Look at Zelda. I, I mean, Zelda so Twilight true. Princess was extended enough away from the prior one that, or sorry, Twilight Princess and then Tears of the Kingdom were, were separated. There is a very high chance that the, the most recent one is the first Zelda they've ever played. So they're not going to understand when I, when I try to compare them or they're not, they're just going to be like, what are you talking about? You're wasting my time. I need to know if the game's good. So it's, oh, it's a cool, it's, it's a cool conversation, but I have noticed in reviews, I have had to actually parse at the end of any long-term review when there's a, you know, like Call of Duty 77, where I'm like, all right, if this is your first Call of Duty, blah. If this is, you know, your fifth, then this. It's it's a weird situation we deal with because you know what? Movies have gotten slightly longer. That's it. Games are the only one where, and you know this, if you walk around and you don't have a music, you don't have anything, you don't have a fucking Apple or whatever, you can still hear music when you walk in a mall or you walk into a bookstore or you go outside. You can still see movies with your family. Games, there is a very high chance that you will have a person who buys a console and that might be their very first game ever played. Yeah, and exactly. there is no other entertainment medium in the world that is like that because all others are passive media. So they can be played passively without the person doing anything. I had a person who just told me that the very first game they ever played in their life was Doom. And I was like, what? And they said, yeah, my mom and dad. And by the way, this is not rare. Their mom and dad allowed cell phone stuff, but they did not allow consoles because the kid was in school, which I actually don't. Parents do what parents do. They can choose whatever they want. They chose that. That person spoke up in our discord, 25 people in there. Nine of them said the same thing. And it wasn't Doom, but it was it was this generation's games. And they're saying, and I said, you had to have gone to a friend's. And they're like, oh yeah, but my friend was playing his game. So I was watching 
and I didn't want to jump into a Zelda for three hours while I was staying the night. And I was like, oh shit, you're right. There, the, there is a very high chance a number of people's only experience might be cell phone games too. And that's why when you and I talk about monetization, when I bitch about monetization, the number of young people who'll be like, the fuck are you talking about? I spent $200 on Farmville and I'm all, oh, true. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So they're <laughs> coming at all. Yeah. So they're, so their parents may not buy a console for whatever reason, because they have a cell phone. They think there's games on there. So they're like, you have enough games. That is not rare. It is not rare for people to be of a much more advanced age, even if it's 14 or 13 to get into this entertainment spectrum where every single other entertainment books, music, movies, they will have experienced passively regardless, even if it's just reading a book because you're in school and you're challenged to read a book for, you know, some one of your classes. So that's the one thing that I've noticed has hugely changed in the last like five or six years. And as gaming gets bigger, cloud streaming, all that stuff, the number of new gamers that I'm experiencing that don't even speak English is very high too. We have some people on our discord that quite literally whew, barely speak English. And I'm like, how do you understand me? I talk a thousand miles an hour in my reviews. Like, how do you, and they're like, oh, I used a translator or I use Google Translate. I'm like, dude, I've your Google Translate sucks. So I don't know how you understood, but they were, they, they shared the same stories. And this is not unknown. Whenever I bring it up to somebody, most people will be like, oh shit, you know what? I bet you if I asked my subscribers, there would be a large number of people that passively they've imbibed every other media but the only one that they may not have taken in until a later age is the first allowance they were ever to spend on a console. And that's another thing when somebody bitches about a console, they'll be like, the S isn't as powerful as the X. True, but it's a hundred dollars less. And if somebody has got an allowance or their first job, that's going to be their first console. And you have to reflect that in a review. You have to say if it works, even if I don't like it, like it just, and that's the weird thing we're dealing with right now. I think with gaming is a lot of feedback in that way. Yeah, and it's really interesting that you bring that up because I didn't even realize a lot of that because it's interesting that my Discord, it's uh, 18 and over. I don't let, mm -hmm. you know, people who are younger in because there have been cases where I've had to do with people Oh, I who should say that's the same with me now that I think about it. But it was, it's in our other Discord, our gamer Discord, where there are younger ones. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, mine's, mine's okay. older too. Yeah, because like there have been people who have lied about their age in there and I've had to boot yeah. so many people out of there. It's just Well, like... you have no clue what somebody <laughs> says. I've heard some young people on my Discord and I'm like, mm, you know, how, how old are you? Yeah, yeah it's, it's true. Like, it's, yeah. You should ask your, you should ask to see or just ask should. your friend or ask the people in your Discord the age at which, especially the younger ones, they had their first true long-term experience with the game. And I guarantee you, you will find a surprising number who it's a later game that maybe we all bitch about because it's, it's the same thing over again. And it's like, yeah, Far Cry 6 is the same thing. But for somebody else, the six, do you know what it means? One. It's their first one. That was first one for me. <laughs> well, there you see. So it, I, I'm, I'm singing to the choir. But yeah, it's, it's, it's something that as a reviewer, you should take it, it, you know, into account. But as when we talk about games, it's definitely something to take into account, length of a game and stuff like that. It's interesting that you mentioned Far Cry because I said that it was one of the best stories from a game I have seen. And like, I genuinely loved it. I posted a tweet about it. I was cheesing that hard. Yeah, six. I loved it so much. And people were like, the most crap I ever got for posting a yeah. tweet, dude. Oh my God, I loved it. And like the fact that they were talking about the uh, Lagaria and all that kind of stuff. It was just, it was so remnant of the stories my dad would tell of his childhood and things that yeah. he had gone through. And it's like, wow, this is really impactful. And people probably don't realize how impactful this story is. And it's so fascinating to me about like how much shit that game got, but it affects people in positive ways with the story. Did you review it? Yeah, I did. So here's the thing I would suggest. I don't know if you did this, but uh, it's something that I just suggest to somebody who's starting their review is make if as long as you give context to why or or to what did resonate with you, I've noticed most people are fine with that. So if I were to say, or, or if you were to say this resonated with me for these reasons, blah, 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 it's much easier, even if you say you love it, for somebody to say, okay, I actually now understand because this person's of this age, 
you know, and I've said it before as a middle-aged guy, this is why this resonated with me or why life is strange surprised me because I was like, why do I like this game? I feel weird. You know, the 17 year old girl is running around. I'm like, should I like this game? So you get those kind of things. I think adding context is actually pretty easy with, with stuff that you're talking about. Cause while I didn't like the game very much, um, what you did say did trigger something in my brain. I liked five. It had technical issues. I rated it weight, but five has that bunker, you know, the Hicks in the woods kind of thing. And I lived in Toledo, Oregon, which is like 3000 people. It's a logging town. That's wow. what I grew up do doing was logging. So to me, that story and the weird religious stuff was just interesting. So I resonated yeah. with the story, which is weird to say you resonated with a Far Cry story. They're not <laughs> known for story. So yeah. if you had added that context, I actually think that's the cool thing about being a, an independent reviewer is because if you add the context of why, and I've messed up and not done it all the time, I mess up all the time and not do that. But if you do, what's really cool about that is somebody may come and watch your review. If they're not just looking at the score, watch your review and go, oh, I, I actually absolutely see where this person's coming from. I may not even agree that the game's, that the game's a 10, but I actually see why you felt, felt the story resonated with you because of these characters and what they're talking about. That's the one thing I do think is missing in a lot of reviews is some context of why a score is given. Have you ever read a review and you get to the end and you're like, this was a fucking live journal. It wasn't a review. It's so true. I'm not lying. How many reviews I've, I've and by the way, this is why I started um, wasn't because I thought I was better. I started because that people weren't reviewing sound music and voice. And I I did music when I was a kid. So I was like, what the fuck? Nobody cares about, why are we buying official soundtracks, but reviews never talk about the music? What the fuck is this? So I was like, I'm going to do reviews and I'm going to add that. I think you and anybody who has any kind of life, there's always something you can add to a review that may, will make somebody else go, I got it. I get it. Yeah. E e and and I not everybody. Yeah, and I try to add as much context for why I like the games the way I do. Like for, uh, what was it? For Resident Evil 1 Remake, which I did a review on years ago. That was the very first game I was ever given oh, wow. as a kid. You know, like I think I played it for the first time when I was like 10 or 11 years old. As an evil, like, your dad is pretty uh, forward thinking. To give you a Resident Evil is your first friggin' game. That's yeah. funny. And my mom was just like, can you get her like a Barbie game or something? Yeah, and he right, was like, right. I want to see the graphics. Lies. Dad, oh yeah, your dad. That. <laughs> yeah, that's was, awesome. That's awesome. Was, was your dad's so cool. the one sitting behind you watching you play, being like, "This is a cool game." Did your and dad was, do games? Did your dad no, play he games? doesn't. He oh. can't stand games a lot of the time, and that's the thing. Like yeah. he's eighty-one, so <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's, right. he's a lot older. And it was really cool to be able to see him like do this craft with me to be able to see me through this and like he would watch me play the game and i said to him at one point i was like this is scary can i just like not play it for a little bit and then i came back to it a little bit later because i couldn't stop thinking about the story of resident evil and i was like dad i gotta finish it can i have it back and he was like yeah sure i it, when i grew up um at target 2600 so that's old i'm i was I, I, it was my dad brought it home and he was a fisherman and it owned a fish plant and I heard him whisper to my mom and say, what is that? And he bought it for us. He knew we wanted it, but he had no, he could not understand it. He was like, it's, you can't eat it. Why are you, why are you doing something with it? Like you can't, because he was very with his hands. He built his own house, he blah, blah, blah. So, he, but he still knew as kids, we wanted shit. He was not, he didn't need us to explain it to him, but I heard him whisper it to my mom. And even now my parents are the same age as your dad. My mom and dad have no clue what I'm doing. They know I'm doing it. They watch it. My mom finds stuff funny, has no clue what I'm talking about. She'll be like, I saw your video on blah, blah, blah. No idea what you're talking about 90% of the time, but good job. And, uh, the, you know, that, that one character was cool. And I'm like, in a way, I guess I should be happy that there's that much. Cause you know, you do have some friends whose parents, they don't, you know, have anything in common where my parents are pretty forward thinking, but it is funny when you get the older parent who's just looking at something going, I have no clue. The kid seems to like it a lot, but what's funny is what you just described is what people are experiencing now where parents sometimes are worried about their kids or worried, so they don't get them a console, you know, or they have a phone and they think that's all they need. And that's yeah. why once again, you will notice that people are getting into gaming. We say they're getting in younger, but I do believe that may not be as true when you start considering consoles and stuff, because when I was growing up, kids at 12 would get a console sometimes. It wasn't unknown. So I don't know how much that's changed, but cell phones yeah. and that kind of stuff has changed. And so that means my demographic is accustomed, like I said, to microtransactions that to me, 
I want to cry. I want to walk into the developer and karate chop everybody. I'm like, why oh, yeah. a skin <laughs> for five? What are you doing? And yet the number of people who told me who have seen a review have been like, yeah, this is nothing to me, like at all. Wow. And it, I, I'm just like, oh, yeah, so things have changed. You know, it's still cool to hold the line, but you do have to understand that a new demographic are entering that have no experience whatsoever with Resident Evil on a console. It's... A lot of my friends just stream no console, no PC. They just uh... stream on a fire stick. Three of my <laughs> friends have fire sticks. They do not have PCs. They buy the game on a Steam account and they stream it GeForce Now and they do not have PCs at all they have no console in their house but they're playing games and i'm like that's a change in life that is a massive change to the way things are delivered to a person like i was just like what and the, the other person was like oh yeah i just stream on my cell phone and plug the hdmi the USB C to the hdmi and i stream geforce now which is a big thing now it, like the cloud is starting to become more and more especially on the pc side so that's another experience where they don't have they don't understand when i say a game takes a while to load or an install time they're like install time there's no install time i hit start on geforce now and it plays i'm like okay that's interesting excuse my shock look at my face what the fuck yeah it's weird it's weird people are it's getting so into strange. stuff in, in, in a completely different way and i mean it is something i think it's pretty important we talk to them in that way Ooh, got my my earphones are giving me an alert they're like but oh. where's your ears let me find them no they're just <laughs> telling me it's running out of battery but um what about so resident evil was your first game so did you very first game did you finish it i ended up finishing it it took me a couple months to finish it because it, here's the thing like when i was a kid it was very kind of a, a tumultuous time because i was very sick as a kid uh all the time and during that i needed a distraction because i mm. have what's known as an overactive immune system so if i get sick i get really sick that's why uh covid was a really big issue w during the time that that was happening because i had to stay indoors a very long period of time um it would have been a death sentence for me if i caught it and for me, like I ended up having really bad eczema, I had really bad scars all over my body and I needed a distraction. So my dad was like, you know what? Let me give her this experience because any distraction is better than nothing at this point. Yeah, that's so cool. So I ended up playing, Res he gifted Resident Evil 1 Remake and Zelda and the Wind Waker as the oh, first wow. two games I ever played. And then mm -hmm. I, f I fell in love with those games. I ended up playing through them so many different times. I can't even count the number of times I played Resident Evil people remake. Damn, that's, yeah, it, I mean, it is weird too when your experience is that, then to you, a third person horror game is gonna be patterned off that. Where somebody else, I mean, me, I played Alone in the Dark, which was a point and click. And so there's just such a difference in, again, which is why I do think it is cool that multiple people review and and that people young get into it that ca carry into it or people who have a a different background get into it because it is interesting how you and i have a completely different start we ended up in the same place but i do wish people were a little bit more open to understanding that uh, like the, the the very backgrounds actually matter it is funny you just i i was just i mean it is so weird that you got into it at that age because by then i was in i was certainly in high school and so it's just interesting to see. I'm trying to think of my first Resident Evil was Sega Saturn. It was, yeah. So oh it's Resident Evil. Yeah, so which cool. is the terrible acted one, which is like <laughs> you, the master of unlocking, need this key or whatever he said. It was like the worst voice acting. And by the way, do you know you know the voice acting, the big hubbub about AI? No way, what's And going voice on? acting. Well, voice actors don't want AI to replace oh, them. Yes. yes, 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 yes. So yes. let me explain to you a mind blowing thing I just told my crew today. I was like, you guys do realize I grew up a majority of my gaming had no voice. It had synthesized AI voice. Yeah, that's true. Then it went to real voice, and now it's going back to synthesized fake AI voice. So when I grew up, they would have, like Sega would go Sega, and it sounded like Sega, but it wasn't. It was a synthesizer where somebody made it sound like the word. And so I went from no sound or no words to the occasional word to Redbook audio on like a Sega CD, which was true audio all the way now back to the point to where people are worried that we're going to replace them with the computers they were already doing their job prior to them starting it's a really weird situation around that but it's just it's it, it, technology it and it depends on like if, a, if somebody's a reviewer depends on how, their age because i do have some people that i know who are truly like 
AI shouldn't do anything, shouldn't be involved in anything. And then other people who are so, super pro to it. And that's the other thing that's going to happen is a like, do you use uh, anything to help you with scripts? Do you use chat GPT or any of the, so that's a dude, do you know the number of people who use it is super high? Yeah. Yeah. They'll write their script, throw it in. And the, uh, m many, will, uh, this is not a secret. Many will admit it, but they'll, you know, because when I grew up, uh, you would have a grammar checker underline the red word. Oh, yeah, misspelled, right. Yeah. And then now we're at the point to where you just say, you know, write me a sentence on this and it'll do it for you. And so it's really interesting to see where we're going to be in five or 10 years, because I just saw a review yesterday that was done by AI. Now the person probably played it, but they used a script that was certainly written by chat GPT and they use a synthesized voice because it's a no face review channel. And I was like, I might be out of a job. In like five it's years. It's ridiculous because, yeah, like a lot of people uh, will ask me if I've done any of my reviews with AI. It's like, no, I never do that because I'm very against AI, right? Like uh, getting people out of a job with writers and voice actors, especially. I'm one of those like, I, I don't agree with yeah. that whatsoever. Um, but for me, it's like, I write, I handwrite all my notes. I'm very old school when it comes to like, so am I, I, I'm, yeah, you know? I handwrite. I have a whiteboard that I write notes on and I took a picture one day and people are like, you're using a fucking right. What are you school marm? And I'm like, no, I just like old style, but I do embrace the tech. It's interesting where you're coming from. Cause we should continue to talk about this because things are changing and they're probably changing at a speed that is way too fast for anybody to stop. And uh, for example, um, to sort of get out in the weeds, but, um, Kyle Hill, who's a science YouTuber, he sometimes covers games and he'll he'll be like, could Kratos' acts really free shit? And he'll do this amazing video. But one of the things he was talking about is the prevalence of science videos online right now that are all written and recorded by AI and everything. And it's blowing up in that space. That's not the only space it's going to blow up in. So what you're talking about with like, you don't want to replace writers and stuff like that. The wor the worry I have in my head is that while you're doing that, 55,000 people are not taking that stance and they're using it. And if we have people, as you've stated, where you get a really weird comment that doesn't make sense about your view, your video, you're like, dude, why did you think that? If they think that on yours, there's a high chance they might watch an AI one and not bulk at that. They yeah, might exactly. just go, meh. And regardless of what industry tech is, I mean, AI is coming into video games too. That's another thing. Is, you and I are yeah. going to have to review a game within a year minimum where something is made by, by AI. And I guarantee you this, I will make a mistake. I've said this on my podcast. I will make a mistake and I will think an AI voice is a real voice. I know it'll happen because I test a bunch. Part. It is. I've heard some AI voices that are so close and that's my job. And I'm like, oh, whoa, that sounds really like Macho Man. You know, that sounds really like Hulk Hogan or whatever. It's not going to take long before some smaller company throws a couple AI voices. And I bet you in the future, at some point, it'll get so good that I'll be like, yeah, the voice actors in this sounded good. I like the cadence. I love the story. And, you know, it'll come out a year later that they were using, they were using an AI system. And that's going to affect you and I both on how you even review games. How do you cover it? What do you, do you complain about it? and then review the game? Or do you say, I'm not gonna review it at all? That's all happening right now too. I mean- Oh yeah. And the thing is, is that I'll still re review the game, honestly, because I always so want there to be a, an honest voice out there telling people, yeah. hey, this has the AI The product in it. is worth this. No. And yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be a very like, weird line. It's the same Go thing ahead, with the Blobber team, with reviewing Silent Hill 2, you know, uh, with all of the controversies that they've been a part of and everything. Because when I think about it, I want to be able to handle this game with as much uh, respect and like, how, what, what word do I even use? Uh, clarity as much as I can, because as a reviewer, you always want people to be aware of what they're buying, of what they're putting yeah. their money into. And I know it's the same for you of where it's just like, you know, I don't want people to get short drift. So it's it, it yeah. was really weird for me whenever I reviewed the medium, I saw how they handled mental health and I saw how everything was done within that game. And I was like, okay, this is really interesting. But then have you ever looked back on one of your reviews and were thinking, I wish I could rewrite that because there are different thoughts I have about it now. Well, luckily, like I was saying, I don't write ever. Um, so, cause I don't script, but I will say there have definitely been, uh, there was one that somebody said, Johnny in our podcast said something and I can't even remember the game, but we were all sitting back and he brought something up in the podcast. It's like a week later. And I'm like, Oh, I should have, 
I should have mentioned that. And no one complained. No one in the world. It was a very high, you know, people liked it. It was actually done. It did really well. But his point was a super valid point that normally I would pick up, but you know, you just missed something. And it was really interesting when Johnny was explaining it. You can see in my face in the podcast. So I was like, oh shit, I didn't, that would have been a very pertinent, but it wasn't something that changed the review score or anything. It was a part of the game that was a very, it was like, it would have taken 30 seconds. And I don't know if it would have even changed anybody's, but it was a really good point that like would be a cool talking point. So I've definitely noticed that. Um, I think most of the time when it comes to reviews, I am pretty, dil I've missed a number of embargoes because I've held on and been like, I haven't decided yet. Or usually I know right away what I think, but there's been times where, I, or I just don't know how to say it because I'm trying to explain something or I really like a part of a game, but I hate the rest. So, you know, it's sort of difficult. Yeah, it is. And it, it, that actually goes into the next topic that I want to discuss is time management as a reviewer. So as yeah. you know, there's a lot that we have to do during the game or whether or not we're playing the game or going into our notes or, you know, in your case, when you're going into the review video and organizing your thoughts of what exactly yeah. you want to say to present it in the best way possible. Um, whenever it comes to, for example, what you do and how you do your reviews, what's your entire process? Like, I know that you said that you teach Teach martial arts so from your job to what you do how do you organize your time effectively for you so you were saying you know you're doing editing and you're writing articles so it's sort of a company plus you're independent i am fully independent so the one thing i do that gives me a bonus and this is just the honest truth is that if a game comes in on sunday night i might play it sunday night i don't have a work day so i don't wait till monday ever i also barely sleep so I usually it's about, I usually make sure I'm very regimented on uh, sleep patterns. So it's usually 1030 to 330, maybe 1130 to 330 that I sleep. And then I, I get up. And so, and sometimes, you know, I'll sleep a little longer, but for the most part, my schedule is I get the code and I start playing pretty quickly. You know, you install it, all that kind of stuff. And then what I do is I gather whatever data I need from them, the release dates, all the, you know, their, their embargo data any notes they've had because they're very good you know it's saying like this has a bug and you know we know that this thing is here and i love that when they tell you the exact thing they're not saying all bugs will be fixed they're like this weapon causes a crash i'm like that is totally fine in a review that is blessed in fact i'm good i'm glad with that because that means the developers have told pr that's important and you need to tell the people so then i get all that data and what i do is i make sure that um Everything hardware wise, I have what's called a clean machine and a dirty machine. So the dirty machine is a Windows machine that is normal used. It's normally used. And then I have a clean machine that is pretty much Windows 11 with just the drivers. And I test the performance on both to see if there's a glitch somewhere. So like if you have a sound driver on one that or a, some program that's indexing files on one and not on the other, you might notice that most games are within a small delta. But I do test that. I test FPS. Uh, later, but I'll test, uh, I'll, te I'll install on both. I'll transfer, I'll, I'll try to see that. And then what I do is I try to play it organically. So the one thing about me is I play the games like I would play a game. I do not want to change it because I'm a reviewer. So I will play the game organically. If I do not like the side quests, I will do some to get the idea of the side quests. And if they do not pull me forward, I will tell the viewer they did not pull me forward. If I did the main story and then went back and did the side quests, I'll tell people that if I, and so I, the reason why I do it organically is because no one has a written rule anywhere that you can say, this is how you are made to review. So my personal opinion is when I started, I noticed everybody at work or friends would always ask me what I thought of a game once I finished it. And I was like, okay, so they care, or I'm, I'm able to tell them, well, should I change when I do YouTube? No. Because if I did change, then would I lose? I might lose the message. I might change the way I play games. So I play very organically. I also have a tendency to play like a child. And I'll just really, if I want to play a game for 24 hours, I will play a game for fucking 24 hours because I'm liking the game. Yeah. And I'm a kid. So I, I'm, I have family and stuff like that. And I'll be like, hey, I, I dig this friggin' game. So I'm not going to go to bed arbitrarily if I'm enjoying the game, just like a child would be like, I'm having a good time playing this game. That's exactly how I play. So there's been times where I've got a game code and I've heard even other reviewers go, ooh, you know, we only have a week and a half. And I'll be like, bitch, I'll be done in 18 hours. I'll be done on the same day I got the code. 
And that is what I do. And so I will make sure to sit down, play only that. Um, I track sound music voice. I do some sample stuff to verify the sound isn't crunchy because some games have pretty bad. Final Fantasy VII in particular has some pretty egregious sound samples. So there'll be things that I track. And then that's that. I get done with it. And then I, if I have notes, like this was good or I like this, what I usually do is I'll train and I'll teach at least once between the between my thought process or I'll go chop wood or I'll do something outside to sort of detach myself. And I don't force my, I either think about it while I'm doing it or I don't. And I've found that both are about the same thing. So if I'm not thinking about it, it means I probably already know what I'm thinking. If I find myself outside or boxing or training and I'm like, did I like the control on this? That usually means I haven't fully decided. And then once I decide, I hit record. That's it. I just hit record and I sup everybody. This is character with ACG. And once again, and then I just go and I talk. And that's pretty much my goal is to play it like I would play it if I had bought it and I had time. You know, I sort of treat it like if I had a weekend and I play it that way. And I find that that works for me. If I was regimented, like five, eight hour days, I would die. I would, I would, it, the idea makes me a little nervous um, because I don't want to stop a game if I like it. I do not, I, the idea of arbitrarily saying it's five, I'm stopping the game. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I mean, I'll stop it if I have like to go to the doctor, but like if, if I don't have to stop, hell no, I won't stop the game because it's a game and I'm enjoying the shit out of it. And arbitrarily stopping, it seems weird. Like, I don't know, but that's me. And I do it different than a lot of people. I mean, Gene, we, you know, Gene Park, like we talked about him. He's, he has a different thought process, even fighting cowboy. I've talked to him about, he does it and he does sponsorships even different. Like I like, I mean, we talk all the time and he's a really cool guy. He, we have really different opinions on a bunch of stuff, but he's sort of the same way. I know he's a little bit more regimented because he has a family, but it's, I, I, the ones I seem to connect with, Honestly, review other reviewers are ones that are, it sounds weird, childlike that are, I don't know any other way to say it, but the ones that I sort of are the ones that will spend a podcast with them. And we're talking for 45 minutes about a cool sound effect in a game. And we're all talking super high and we're like, and hey, did you hear the sound when you grabbed the coin? That was a great, that's, if that ever goes away, I will stop. Like I would stop instantly if I ever couldn't get that excited about something. Yeah. Do you, do you work, uh, do you, do you try, I mean, cause you have a different life than me, you know, so everybody's different. Do you, do you have a specific schedule that you have to keep or? Oh yeah. I'm a very type A personality. I need a, a schedule in order to do everything. So what I normally do is I'll go to bed around like 10 or 11, wake up at five 30, uh, work out, do everything I need to do. Um, I also am like a part-time caretaker for my dad. Uh, oh, gotcha. so I'll, yeah, so I'll do everything I need to help him with. Like if he's doing work outside, then I'll do work outside with him. Um, I put all my family stuff in the morning, like from like five 30 until move. about seven. Yeah. yeah. I'll do everything then. And then I'll be like, okay, so this is my time to get work done for windows central or game informer. If they send me anything or any of my stuff that I need to do for YouTube, I'll play a couple of hours of a game and then I'll go and work out. And then if I'm still thinking about the game, I'll continue to write notes and do what I need to do for that. Once it gets to four o'clock, that's my time with my family. And I'm having oh, dinner. interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'll have my dinner. I'll put work aside. I'll do everything I need to do before that. Because during like the time for me, like I'm a morning and a night person, like I could stay up until, you know, the right. crack of dawn right. playing something for a review. But for me, it's very important that I keep a 5 a.m. schedule because for my mental health, it's absolutely crucial because I have depression. I have anxiety. I have PTSD, um, undiagnosed PTSD, but I know I have it. And it's very important for me to keep those schedules or else I will spiral very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I get that. So, yeah. So for me, if like, for example, if I'm reviewing a very specific game and the review needs to go out at a specific time, like my one with Suicide Squad, I will literally play the game for like three hours in chunks so I can get it done and start the review and then hand it over. Cause suicide squad was the one I did for windows central, but the one I'm doing currently right now, I can take a little bit of time with it. Um, I'm currently doing two reviews on my end for Baldur's gate three and dark souls two. And I write those at the same time. So I'll, oh, okay. write, I'll write for an hour, my Baldur's gate one, and I'll write for an hour by dark souls two one. And I just switch my brain to completely different mentalities. Yeah. Yeah. No, I actually, I mean, that's actually pretty healthy, especially when 
I think a lot of people uh, like when I, I'll stop to eat and I'll, I'll hang out and I'll do family stuff when those are available. But it, it, the, the weird thing about all of us and the, even the people I talk to is that regardless of what goes on in the time you spend, what I've noticed, at least with the more pre, with the more prominent reviewers or people who are really good at getting stuff out, if they don't have an editor and they're just by themselves is the there's usually a schedule mine's no schedule mine's a schedule too but there's usually a schedule for waking up i've noticed and i don't know exactly there's probably some psychology i know for me i had to figure out after years of what the exact time i had to wake up was otherwise if it was it, rem sleep there was some issue so i had to figure out every 45 minutes i could wake up if i woke up earlier i was ruined for the day i felt like shit you know you'll hear people say they slept in and they feel terrible a lot of times it's not the sleeping in it's that they woke up in the middle of a rem sleep so then they're screwed up so I found you found 530. I bet you 530 would be fine for me. I just went a little earlier, but I've noticed that a lot of the people that can get out something that's, you know, on time and stuff like that are usually early risers. I don't know if that's, but it's like everybody I talk to who I consider to be pretty high output, or at least they have a, a ton of shit going on, but they, even if they're review, even if their schedule for videos isn't high, almost all of them have been the people that have a very sort of an exact time for waking up. They, it's like, I wake up, I have a schedule. And even though my schedule is more free form, it's the same exact thing. It's like the, it, it, I, it ruins my, it ruins my mentality. If I wake up at an off time, yeah, like it, same. <laughs> things feel weird. And you, have you ever done that thing where you wake up and you're like, okay, I might still be asleep or I might be <laughs> yes. up, but your brain is surface level. And if you try to think deep, your brain's like, dude no it's not happening like well you're all what two plus two is a what is going on tell my mom if you like fire bad tree pretty that's where my brain yeah is where right things now. don't make sense yeah it. yeah where your brain is your brain's just like dude this is not working out for me you can move at most but everything else probably not gonna work working is out in the morning i think helps for a lot of people too it does. Yeah. No, oh God, I have such like a good relationship with working out because for me, that is absolutely fundamental because I do a lot of like either not intensive cardio stuff because I have asthma. Uh, but if I have like, like moments of workouts where I'll do like ballet style workouts for mm -hmm. me, it's really good. Cause like I live in upstate New York, so I'm bringing in lumber. I'm doing like really physical activities every single day. So it gets to a point of where you need to stay healthy. You need to have a useful body to be able to live and work yeah, with. Yeah, 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 that's, uh, yeah, that's what we do most of the time. I mean, we definitely lift weights, but a lot of it has changed towards body movement stuff, especially for martial arts, where it's not a bunch of heavy lifting. It used to be, but a lot of injuries sort of killed that. I think a lot of people who lift heavy, especially when they're younger, you'll, you, they start to switch out or like you with a bad knee, somebody will be like, my back's bad. I've luckily only have one issue and it is a bad back, but it's from something else. But it, it, I have noticed for a lot of people, especially as they get a little bit older, it's like, what can I, I don't want to just pump iron. I want to actually be physically able to bend over and, you know, you'll get a person who's yoked, who's like, I can't get my deodorant off the wall. And I'm like, dude, seriously, man, you're like, you could lift the wall, but you can't stretch over there. It's like, you should probably stretch your hammies a little bit. So the last topic I want to get into, I thought this would be a little bit of a fun one to do is if you can say, what games are you currently reviewing? I know you just did a preview for your review of Final Fantasy Rebirth. Yeah, I can't talk about one of them. You know, that's sort of because of the embargo. Um, let me let me look real quick and verify what I can talk about. I've made a mistake in the past <laughs> and I've accidentally leaked what I was working on. Um, I am doing, no, I can't talk about that one either. Uh, let's see what, okay. Uh, let me, this is a good question. And I always get nervous because I No, you're fine. I, I, I get, I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So I did final fantasy and then I have, um, oh, I can't talk, uh, I think I can talk about, you know what? Nobody's going to get mad at me for this. I'm reviewing, um, uh, mud runners expeditions. Which is a yeah, it's a change of the Mud Runners, Snow Runners format, and I'm a huge fan of those games because they they remind me of like in the Pacific Northwest, just you know going out in the mud and stuff like that, which I'm a big fan of. I just love that kind of exploration game. I'm I am a fan of the slightly slower games, so you know those kind. I did just review Pacific Drive, which is phenomenal. That game was ridiculously good. Um, that is actually it. That is uh, there's some games I know that are going out here soon, but um. For me, I had COVID and 
I, we lost power for 11, 10 days in the Pacific Northwest due to an ice storm. So I was behind on everything all through January and February has honestly been me turning down most codes to get old, you know, or to, to identify one. I knew Final Fantasy was coming. So it was like Final Fantasy was the big one that I'm reviewing or that I got done reviewing. And that was a long the game is. Yeah. And it's there's so much. It was an NDA that was really. Tight, strict, and so. To do that was probably, in all honesty, in the last eight years, there's probably only been two other reviews that were that stressful because I did, I don't know if you ever heard me talking about this, but I accidentally did, I broke embargo for Redfall. And yeah, yeah. And that was as unfun as any one experience could ever be. And it was an automatic system I used for uploading and it got mm. the wrong date, which is normal because oh, no. most reviews are in the morning and theirs was in the afternoon. It was a very odd review time. But I'm super careful now about that stuff. And so with this one, I was like really diligent. And I think I burned my brain. I was so nervous because it was pretty strict. And so I did the warning at the starting of the video and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm telling you, you would not believe how many times I watched that video. I wanted to gag. I, I don't like, I, I don't <laughs> mind hearing my voice once in a review. But at the seventh time at 3 a.m. and the review was coming out three hours later, I was like, and I bleary eyed, you know, and you're looking at it going, did I cut too soon from that? Did I show this character? Oh, it was ridiculous. And it, it, you know, they're always awesome with that kind of stuff. And it is your contract. I take it deadly serious. I've never broken an embargo before. And once I broke one and I, I it's so funny because I think Gene, yeah, I, I believe Gene, but a bunch of people, Mike Williams, who's awesome. He used to work at uh, US Gamer Net. I talked to him all the time and I'm like, dude, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do because not only did I break the embargo, I called it one of the worst games I've ever, it was bad. Oh, no. Like that game was bad anyway. <laughs> it was, and but yeah. I, yeah. And I said, you know, I said, I don't care. The contract isn't that I say it's good. The contract is that I won't say anything. And I've always been super diligent. Like when somebody asks me, I'm like, sorry, it doesn't matter if it's a reviewer, they'll DM you and be like, Hey, can you? And a lot of times I'll be like, I'm going to leave that guy on read because I don't know if he's going to take this data and tell somebody it's like, I can't answer your question. And with that one, once that happened, I, I became really strict. And so I chose just uh, just um, Final Fantasy because I, I knew it was coming. I was like, I'm going to be really diligent. And then Pacific Drive, they were really cool. But yeah, that game burned me out. I don't know if you've ever had a game like that, but there was something about Final Fantasy that I just, it was really exhausting. Not in a, the game wasn't. It was just big and really strict. I don't know if you've had one of those super strict embargoes, but when they're really strict and they're very militant when they talk to you they're like there was some there was a couple i've gotten recently that are like you can do exactly this but not this yeah. you can do this and you're reading it going i did that yeah. but what yeah there was so one i don't know I had what from, yeah what was one you've had it was for writers republic oh from ubisoft yeah was it just uh was it strict in timing or was it strict in like what you can show or? it was strict in the language of where like you can't even have people in the same room with you while you're playing it yeah stuff like that yeah, yeah. it was yeah. really interesting you, i was like whoa okay <laughs> have you ever noticed too that most of the time they're not because i will literally get an email that says here's your code for this game and the embargo is here and i'll have to email them back and go right but what can I not show? I'm like, oh, you can show anything. And, and that, though, by the way, huge companies. That's what's always so weird. I was completely confused. I had a particular idea and much of it has stayed the same, but a couple things I did think was that larger companies might try stuff that smaller ones won't, you know? Yeah, some, exactly. And what I've actually found is that it's not usually, it, that has happened, but there's been other smaller companies or stuff that's popped up where I'm like, I do not like the wording of this entire discussion. Like, I do not like the way it's going. I don't like the way we're talking to each other. It sounds very cagey. And it, it's actually been interesting to me, like you said with Writers Republic, that they were strict because I've found for the most part, Ubisoft's been pretty um, blasé, I guess. Like, just like, here's the review. Please don't show this. But there, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get NDAs with a lot of bullet points a lot so there that just are, seems yes. to be a, yeah yeah i don't I, I don't know i've talked to jez a little bit about this on dms we've talked a couple times and 
talked about reviews. I think I actually, he might've been one of the people I emailed when the Redfall one came out. I might've been, uh, might've not been him, but I'm, I'm sure he's had to deal with it too. And, and then you, you have the leak kind of stuff that pops up as well, but you don't ever want to break a review, a, a review embargo because it's like any contract we have isn't about what I say. It's about the timing. Like if you're nice enough to give me the code, I should be nice enough to not break the embargo. And that's what's pissed me off at times is I've seen people like hint on Twitter it's and they're pretty so big sad, reviewers yeah. sometimes. And it actually makes me mad. They'll be like, I can't talk about blah, blah, blah. But, and I'll be like, dude, everybody in the world knows what you're talking about. Like, why are you, why are you doing that when it says right in the video or right in the NDA or whatever, you're not supposed to mention this kind of stuff. You get that sort of, uh, this sort of oddity. What are you reviewing? Uh, currently I am well, oh, okay, what two, can you of, talk two about? of them. Yeah. yeah. Two of them. I can't talk about, um, okay. what, and there's going to be two others that I probably won't be able to talk about, but I'm crossing my fingers because it'll be massive if I even get them. Um, one of them, I keep all my, phys what I do for like, before I decide to review anything on my side for my channel, I'm not going to change a camera again. I'm letting it go. This we'll time. just go Screw ahead, it. wrap it up. Just what, what, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the other, the other one that I'm reviewing right now, doing a playthrough for Lords of the Fallen. Um, yeah. I'll gather like physical games that I have in my collection that I haven't reviewed that I keep them as a stack right next to me. That way I know, okay, I'm reviewing these for my end. So I know which ones are separate for work reviews. Right. Uh, the other one I'm going into, which you mentioned actually earlier, LA Noir. <laughs> yeah. So you've never played LA Noir? Uh oh. <laughs> oh, it's wicked. It's so good. I'm so excited. At least to me. It's at least to me, it is, and it, it looks old. You know that it's an older game, but um, I hope, I hope you enjoy it even a tenth as much as me because that game. I've done other videos that aren't even review videos on walking the world because I do the walking the walk videos. That game is is seriously. I, god damn, I hope they do a sequel. I don't think they will, but I, it's good. I think you'll like it. Did you get it? What was that Xbox One? Or, uh, yeah, it was for Xbox One okay, about playing cool. on Series X, yeah. Uh, the okay, other one cool. is Grand Theft Auto V. I've never played a Grand Theft Auto game before. I don't know how to handle that. <laughs> uh, you've never played a Grand Theft Auto game? So I played one briefly at my ex's house when I was in college. That was the only experience I have. I never played one fully. That is going to be yeah. highly interesting to see because we talked about movement and stuff, and that game feels old because it is old. I mean, yeah. that game's ancient. Um, I can't wait to see what you think about like how the characters interact because it is one of the older ones where like things feel a little janky compared to now. So to be, are you going to review it based on now or are you going to say, are you going to review it ignoring the technology that's happened up until now? Like ignoring the technology that's happened until now, okay. what I do with a lot of games, especially what I did with Halo CE, when I reviewed that for the first time was I reviewed it for what it is in the game moment in what it's doing. So, okay, cool. That'd yeah. be cool. That'd be cool. I think I, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, I mean, to me, it's a, it's a phenomenal game, but it definitely, I played it recently and I was all damn, <laughs> this is creepy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a couple times. What about, uh, uh Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, ahead. I have Sorry. three other ones that I'm going to be reviewing yeah, on my it. end. Uh, Fires of Rubicon, Armacord. Again, never played an Armacord game before going into this gotcha. one. And then Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Spider-Man 2. My cast decided so you to played, be weird. <laughs> you yeah. played Spider-Man 1? I played Spider-Man 1, yes. I loved it. Sp Spider-Man 2, I, I, so I love them all. I love I love the Spider-Man games. But I can't wait to see 2 because 1 is amazing. It's, you know, it's big. Two has a technical flex that you can almost smell Insomniac's developers just in the back doing a bicep curl. <laughs> I don't even want to tell you until you play it, but it's it's just right away where I was like, oh my, holy shit, that's a flex. It is it is a moment where you, it, it, it just ties into, you know, PlayStation does this and Xbox is this powerful and all, you know, how every company talks about their system. Trust me, two is compared to one, there are parts in two where you're like, Oh, wait, what just happened? It was really a, an aw an awesome experience if you care about tech. There was some crazy shit. You're, it's cool to hear somebody who hasn't got to experience those because the Spider-Man games are really good storytellers. <clears throat> like, they're oh, yeah. really good storytellers. They're, oh, yeah. I, those guys are phenomenal at that. Um, yes, did you do Ratchet and Clank? My, I've never done Ratchet and Clank before. You should try that. I think you might like Ratchet and Clank. Add another game to your 15 games you're reviewing. I know, right? It's going to be like, by the time I'm 90, it'll be like 85 years later. <laughs> yeah, you'll be finally doing Spider-Man 4 or whatever. <laughs> but dude, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, it's I been really a blast. Appreciate I appreciate it. it. Three hours. 
I know, right? This is actually to date my longest podcast I've ever done. Oh, there we go. People are going to be complaining, but I, I, I do want to say, I appreciate you inviting me on And it's always awesome to talk to people who uh, sort of come at everything in a different, it, like a, sort of a different tact from everybody else. Continue doing it. Just ignore the, ignore the negatives and, and create like, that's what you should do. It's awesome to see somebody like you who's going out there and congrats on being a good editor, because I don't know where it comes from, but you got, you got the mojo because damn, I'm going to have to hire you to edit. Cause I just don't get it. But you, yeah, you got the spirit. I'm really happy. I'm really happy. You're doing well. I hope it continues for you. Thank for you. Sure. I really appreciate that. It means a lot coming from you. It's uh, I just love being in this industry and I just love games and I love getting to create stuff. It's so much fun. It really is. Yeah. It's, it's so awesome. It's awesome to see somebody excited because I, I'm sure you've seen this, but there'll be times where you can tell people aren't. You know, yeah, no, and so exactly. it's always cool to see people who are like really genuinely like doing it, covering. Yeah, but you guys, if you all like our faces and what we do, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell down below. I make videos every weekday here on YouTube. May you find your worth in the waking world, your hunter. Stay casually nerdy. Now we'll see you all in the next video. Ubasa. Peace out.